Tribe. Oh, right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the... Which one's this? The Wolf Den Podcast? Yes. You go, you go on another podcast one time and you forget I'm how many I'm not used podcasts. to the back yeah. and forth anymore. Uh, it's this one. It's Ed. this one to stay. God damn it! <laughs> this one to stay. Still less technical issues than the non tender podcast. <laughs> it's like if you add more people... Too many There's cucks. just more things for them to mess Not up. Not just a meme show. Hi, guys. Hey. Welcome. How you doing? Good to see ya. Wolf Den Podcast. Hey. Bang, bang. Cool. Today, we got a lot of things to talk about. We do. Uh, too many things. Uh, we're going to start off with some uh, freaking new handhelds. Yes. That were yeah. announced all last week. We got that. We got some uh, f- news about the new Assassin's Creed that got revealed last oh, week. Oh, yeah. We, gotta uh, talk about that. we have... Uh, we got a lot of PlayStation news about PS5 sales in regards to PS4 sales. Uh, games that might be coming to PS5. Old games. Old games from when games. I was a youngin. Oh, so, okay. Uh, what else we got? You're about PlayStation 2 games? Because yes. Because you were old. I was in high school. <laughs> that was the last time I could be considered young. <laughs> you bought a PS2 with your own money. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You so you were old enough to have a job. Was it a job or was it birthday money? I'm pretty sure you had a job when you got it. Maybe. I don't remember. We it were late a, to the PlayStation 2. We were. But still early enough to play all the hits. Mm-hmm. Most of the hits. A majority of the hits. <laughs> uh we got that. We got uh more Call emulation. Of Duty. Call of Duty. Call of Duty Game Pass? Game maybe pa- not maybe, Game Pass. I don't know. Maybe yes. it's a new Game Pass. A lot, a lot more, of things. We got that. We got other Microsoft shit going on. Uh, we got... Uh, f- we well, got a lot. Yeah, we got, we, we got, we got stuff. We, we got yeah, Boy, howdy. Turns out we sure do got a lot. It's a show tonight. It's quite the show today. Uh, before we get into that, let's say thank you to Jeffrey Sorensen for 35 months, War Machine for nine months, oh. and also Farmagooch. For the five bucks over on YouTube. Bob, did you see this Mario Maker 64? I played it on damn <laughs> Twitch. I played it. It's and that's one of the stories. Yes. Also, it's really good. But we'll talk nice. about it. Uh anyway, let's just plow right ahead with the first news topic, which yes. is I and Neo back at it again, announcing 1,000 different <laughs> handhelds. Uh, as part of Aya Neo's remake product lineup, the company has announced a pair of new portable handheld gaming uh, devices inspired by classic Game Boy hardware, albeit far more powerful. The Aya Neo Pocket DMG is a new vertical handheld modeled after the iconic Game Boy Pocket or Game Boy Advance SP and powered by the Snapdragon G3X Gen 3 gaming platform. So we talked about this last week. Yes. All we saw was the back of it. Yes. This is what the front looks like. Yes. Uh, we were wondering whether or not it would be Android or if it would be Windows. It is, I mean, based on the Snapdragon, sounds like it's, uh, Android. Yes. However, uh, Windows just announced a whole bunch of Windows, uh, ARM-based, ARM-based, uh, devices uh, devices that are all running on Qualcomm Snapdragons. Yes. So, who knows? But... (laughs) I'd imagine this is just an Android device. Yeah. Uh, where was I? The sleek and minimal design is optimized for vertical gaming, uh, and the 3.92 inch OLED display sports an impressive resolution of 1240 by 1080 and a pixel density of uh, 419 PPI. What the hell aspect ratio? <sighs> didn't the Game Boy have a weird aspect ratio? It had a square aspect ratio, didn't it? No. It was very close to square. Yeah. But it is not square. Um, as the handheld geared towards uh, sprite-based retro gaming emulation, having an OLED display is a definite selling point and it will make many games look better than ever thanks to the brilliant contrast and color accuracy. Ioneo's second retro-inspired handheld uh, got reveal- that got revealed is the new Ioneo Pocket Micro, which is reminiscent of the pocket or key ring size Game Boy Micro uh, that played Game Boy Advance cartridges on a tiny 240 by uh, 160 pixel 2-inch screen. Uh, the iNeo Pocket Micro is a little bit larger, but still tiny. It has a 3.5-inch IPS display with a resolution of 960 by 640 pixels, effectively four times the Game Boy Micro. Not that the Game Boy Micro was cutting-edge device. 
Uh, it is powered by the MediaTek Hello G99 system on a chip, which INEO claims is more than enough power to play GBA games at four times the resolution. Uh, with That's its, not saying much at all. Yeah. <laughs> With its CNC aluminum alloy frame, Ooh. additional shoulder buttons, and analog sticks, uh, this is a pocket and key ring size portable gaming handheld. I like the idea of this, uh, but INEO devices are usually really expensive. Yeah. Uh, they're usually very premium feeling. Uh, I, I heard that the, uh, the, their last Android-based one that they did uh, was very premium feeling, but it was also very expensive and uh, not as good or powerful as the Ein Odin. So, right. Uh, or it, maybe it was just as powerful, but it, it still, it, something was weird about it. But at the very least, it looked and felt premium. So I think that uh, if this is a little tiny guy that's like the size of a Game Boy Micro and it's nice and, uh, and aluminum and premium feeling, yeah. this could be really cool. Uh, it's a pretty low resolution. That's the exact same screen resolution as the bottom half of the INEO flip. Okay. So, and that was the perfect aspect ratio for Game Boy Advance. So okay. this, like they said, it's four times the Game Boy Advance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's good, but I would hope that there's some more power in here. Well, I'd imagine so. I mean, they put two analog sticks on there, which leads me to believe they think this can run at the very least PlayStation 1 games. Well, there's... There, yeah, I'm sure it'll do PlayStation 1. PlayStation 1 shouldn't be too hard. Right. But there's this weird like thing that these handheld companies are doing where they're just throwing analog sticks on devices that right. don't need them. Like devices that can't even play uh, past PlayStation 1. They're just right. putting analog sticks on it for some reason. Maybe they think people are used to that now on controllers and stuff. Like They just yeah. expect analog sticks to be there. Maybe I, there are weird people who play their 2D platforms with analog sticks. I would prefer no analog sticks because it's easier to put in your pocket. Yeah. You know? Uh, an analog stick is extremely helpful for uh, Dreamcast and N64. Mm -hmm. um, but that you only need one. You yeah. don't need two. So, I don't know. Uh, we, we don't know what this will play up to. I mean, we know the, the, the SOC that it's going to have, but I don't know anything about mm -hmm. it. There's so many names for so many different SOCs. Yeah. I don't know which ones can play what. Uh, and that's it. We don't know how much it's going to be, how much either of these are going to be. We don't know when, really. Well, like you said, it'll probably be expensive because INEO makes yeah. expensive things. It'll probably be expensive. I'm wondering why the DMG has this uh, resolution. 1240 by 1080. According to Google's new AI. Oh, God. Uh, it says 31 by 27, which is close to 10 by 9. Yeah. But not exactly 10 by 9. Uh, that's such a weird aspect ratio. Uh, the, the, why wouldn't they go with something more similar to like how the, uh, the, the, the analog pocket, the analog pocket was That's exactly ex 10 times. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, analog, like they're hyper-focused on Taylor making their devices to like one specific machine mm -hmm. of I and EO and like these other companies are more like broadly focused. Well, you say that, but the. The pocket. I mean, it's supposed to be a Game Boy, right? But it plays a lot. Yeah. It well, that's the thing. It plays a lot. So it, while it may be reminiscent of one device, it's designed to be an all-in-one mm -hmm. machine. So like getting the screen to be one exact thing mm -hmm. isn't the priority for them necessarily. So this one does just have one analog stick. Yeah. But it makes it so much less pocketable. Look at that. Look I at know. That thing like, stick out. <sighs> It almost makes you. And it's so low. It kind of makes you wish they had a yeah. The the position of it it makes it almost effectively useless. But yeah. like, why aren't they using like the like the three DS style slider? Like yeah. that that would have made it low profile. I miss that. We're not getting enough of that. The three DS yeah. little circle slider. I mean, people didn't like it at at the time because it's it's a it's an inferior joystick design. Yes, but like when you're talking about pocketability and portability. You, know, you need it. You yeah, need that. Like, yeah. like the Even, Ionial Flip has full size thumbsticks, yeah. but they're recessed in a weird way where it's really uncomfortable. Yeah. So, just let me have the little circle. Even pad. like Joy-Con joysticks are like raised like a little bit. That would make it hard to like. Yeah. Pocket. This uh, is, like like you're not using this for every game. This is no. just like a luxury. Like like especially how low it is. Make it yeah. a circle pad. Why yeah. not? And put it over here so it's easier to. 
mm-hmm. the touch. This is a this is a, a weird one, but this I, I'd imagine this is going to be pretty expensive. I'm hoping yeah. that the micro one is a little cheaper because it's smaller and a way lower resolution. Yeah. Um, that one I could imagine like a hundred dollars, which is still kind of a lot. Uh, but this one, this one's going to be a lot of money. Mm-hmm. I could imagine. Uh, anyway. Anthony Mille, thank you for the 100 bits. You know, this reminds me of when my father left me as a young lad. What did we do? <laughs> what did we do to you? Hanuman K1, thank you for the 19 months. Kaba Cryptid, thanks for the Prime. And Sukasa, thank you for the 29 months. Hey, Bob and Will, have you heard of Mario 64? Mario Maker 64. Now they're just trolling me. <laughs> uh, are you going to review Retro Game Console HDD? What the fuck are you talking about? What's it called? I don't know. Is, is that, that might be one of those hard drives that Retro comes with Game like a... Retro Game Console HDD. I think it's one of those hard drives that just comes with a million games. Got I think, I think uh, RGT did a video on it. Sounds very illegal. Mm-hmm. Don't want nothing to do with that. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, we don't know uh, when it's coming out. Uh, I think, didn't it go on Indiegogo already? Oh, did I didn't see that in the... Oh, All their stuff goes on Indiegogo first, right? Yeah, it's really annoying. Both handhelds were announced over the weekend, so stay tuned for pricing info and availability. It's really annoying because they put it on Indiegogo, you fund it, you mm-hmm. don't get it for like two or three months, mm-hmm. and then they announce another one before you even get yours, and if you don't make it to the funding round uh you if you don't pre-order basically you don't get one because like right. they sell it on their website after the fact but sometimes they just don't yeah so there is no room with i and neo products for uh second round like like you you're you basically have to early adopt an i and neo product or mm-hmm. you're not going to get one right which is super annoying. also you save like a hundred dollars by yeah. by doing the kickstarter so they kind of give you, put you in this weird, shitty position where you have to buy the product that nobody has reviewed and, uh, and, and nobody has vetted yet. Right. So it's that, it sucks. And, and a lot of companies do that, but INEO is, is, the, is the worst one. So those are the two. You got the INEO Pocket DMG and the Pocket Micro. And I thought there was another one, but... We can skip that one. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move to now the Ein Odin 2. I called I called it the light, and I even emailed them and called it the light. It's called the mini. The Ein Odin 2 mini. The cor- light is a completely different product. Oh, good to know. The Ein Odin 2 Mini is an upcoming handheld game console for the makers of the Ein Odin and Ein Loki line of devices. The name suggests that this Android-powered game console is a smaller version of the Odin 2 that launched last summer, and it does have many of the same specs while sporting a smaller screen and lighter weight body. Uh, But the new version also features a new body with rounded sides and physical design that is heavily inspired by the PlayStation Vita. Uh, Despite looking like a handheld that was released more than a decade ago, under the hood is a modern device uh, with the kind of hardware that you'd expect from a recent flagship phone. Uh, and then down here it lists the specs, 5-inch screen, 1080p, uh, mini LED, Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, uh, 8 or 12 gigs of LPDDR5X RAM, uh, 128 or 256 gigs of storage. So it's pretty much the same as the Ein Odin 2, which is interesting. Because the yeah. Ein Odin 2 is very nice and very powerful, but it's a, mm-hmm. I don't want to say it's big. But it's big as far as Android devices go. Uh, it's got a much smaller battery, so I hope that right. uh, the mini LED uh, runs a little, a, a, a little more energy efficient. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, it seems to just be smaller and lighter. Uh, but it looks like it's going to be three hundred and twenty nine dollars for the eight gigabytes of RAM, mm-hmm. or four hundred dollars for the twelve gigabytes. That's kind of a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if it's as powerful, that's cool. I really like how small it is, and, and I, I like that it looks like a, a PS Vita. Yeah. I, I like the form factor a lot, and it's very thin. And the back, I don't have a picture of the back here. Oh, there, there's yeah, the size the comparison. Oh. 
Yeah, the back looks exactly like a Vita. Oh, yeah. Like literally just a Vita. Mm -hmm. You don't have the touchpad, of course. But no, but... That's the size comparison. It is... It looks ridiculous compared yeah. to the, the, the Odin, too. Uh, and suppose it, it seems like it might be just as powerful. I, uh, there, there is some thermal stuff going on with the Odin, too, so uh, maybe they have that figured out. I don't know. Uh, uh, once again, I don't think we have any word on pricing or anything. Uh, not, not pricing. Uh, release date? Release date, yeah. Um, according to the article, the company hopes to begin selling it sometime this summer. Okay. This, I think, might hit Indiegogo as well. I okay. think the Odin 2 also did. So I wouldn't be surprised if this did as well. Uh, I like Ein, or I, I liked Ein until I had my little kerfuffle with them about the, uh, the Windows-based d devices. They, right. they were great because they came out of nowhere. They had the Odin, and, and it was finally like a great uh, retro handheld. That mm -hmm. did everything like like relatively decent. Right. Everything before that, it was a pain in the ass to get games on. It was a pain in the ass to uh to to pl play the games that you want to play. It, it this one had like a great UI and everything right. that was built in. You didn't really have to do too much. You could just out of the box start playing stuff or or, or start putting emulators on there. Uh, then the rest of the industry kind of caught up, and then Ein caught the bug, and they decided they wanted to release 14 different SKUs of mm -hmm. the same shit. And then they got into the PC market, the PC handheld market, and they released way too many. They canceled half of them. Uh, it took me forever to get mine. They gave me the runaround about getting mine, um, the, the one that I paid for. Uh, and it wasn't until I complained on Twitter that they decided to finally ship me mine. Yeah. Uh, and we just got the Odin 2 earlier this year, and now they're giving us the light just a couple months later. So. Uh, they're starting to piss me off in the same way that uh, that I and Neo did. Right. So. But this looks cool. <laughs> so we'll Could see. Could this be the one that wins Bob back? It needs to be a little cheaper. Yeah, because hundred dollars is ridiculous. At that price point, just get a Steam Deck and you yeah. get like everything. I always people always ask me that, uh, and and if you if I will always say that the Steam Deck is the retro handheld to get if you mm -hmm. want to play emulation stuff on it it's perfect for like everything even if you want to just dock it on the tv it's perfect yeah. for that uh these are the same price so like why would you yeah. want this it, it, it's cool if you have just money laying around it's cool to have something that's smaller than a steam deck but the steam deck's the best value yeah you can't you can't beat that at all uh so there you go. If you were worried, I know a lot of you were worried that we were running out of retro handhelds. Well, don't don't you worry. Don't worry. There's so many retro to, to go. Part of me wonders, like, do people actually buy this stuff, or do like these companies just make it for YouTubers to talk? I think about that as well. <laughs> but I see like there's like a like a like an emulation subreddit, and uh, it's a lot of people. It's all the same people who buy all of these. Right. People just collect all of them. Yeah. So, and I'm, listen, I'm not going to make fun of them. Right. Because <laughs> I am them. I am that person. I am getting fucking sick of it, though. Right. They're all the same, and they're all playing the same games. Mm hmm And he, I, things need to be different. Things need to be more fun. Like, like I like the vertical one. Like, that's all right. We're getting yeah. interesting. Things are different now. Mm -hmm. This one looks like a Vita. All right, it What's looks the, like a Vita, but it's playing the same who's shit. Who's releasing the, the SP? Uh, Anne Bernick has one. And yeah. Miyu is making one as well. Okay, I'm also yeah. getting sick of them making the same fucking thing. Every, every, they're both right. releasing the same shit. I, I, should, I should be getting the Anne Bernick one any minute now. Everybody already released their videos on it, though. Right. Uh... Anyway, uh, one more thing that I put in here. Uh, retro. This is from Retro Dodo. Uh, this is the one you've been waiting for. <laughs> this is the one you've been waiting for, guys. Uh, Mario Builder 64 brings user-generated content to Nintendo's classic platformer. So this is uh, a ROM hack for Mario 64 where you can build your own levels. It's, it it kind of makes it exactly like Mario Maker. Right. Modders have released Mario Builder 64, a tool that allows players to create and share their own user-generated levels. The new ROM hack for the classic Nintendo 64 title produced by homebrew developer 
Rovertronic, and Arthur Tilly allows players to design and build their own Mario 64 levels with the ROM as demonstrated in the beautiful orchestrated trailer below. Uh, the new open source ROM hack is playable via emulation, although gamers looking to experience Mario, Mario Builder 64 on play original hardware can get the software running with a few extra steps. Players hoping to jump into a world of 64-bit design and build gameplay with will need to patch their vanilla ROM files with the .bps file available from romhacking.com. So you don't they don't actually give you a ROM. Right. You have to patch Provide it your yourself own. and that's I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like when they do that cuz that should be above board. Much should like, be. Should be, but I, if Nintendo decides they don't like you, yeah, they're going to get you anyway. Uh, much like its official 2D counterpart, Super Mario Maker, Mario Builder 64 allows players to create 3D levels in Mario 64's distinct art style, making use, uh, making use of familiar art assets from the original 1996 game. Adding the adding to the authenticity of Mario Builder 64 is the ability to add a variety of gameplay elements, including enemies, coins, switches, platforms, and stars into the mix. Into the mix. mix. Stars. While the ability to create your own Mario 64 levels is an enticing one, perhaps the strongest selling point, at least in my eyes anyway, according to the person who wrote this, comes from sharing those creations with the wider Mario community. Players have already begun crafting and sharing their creations online, and some of, of the results are undeniably excellent so uh i have played this i streamed it uh on sunday i'm gonna bring up that stream now if i can uh it was a little it took a little bit to get the game going mm -hmm. so you need to use it's it's a it's an emulation front end. do i want to call it an emulation front end it's called parallels that's okay. the emulator that you use, but emulate parallel. Oh, it's a launcher. Parallels launcher. Okay. That launches RetroArch and Got messes it. around with it so that it's like perfect for for, yeah, yeah. for the game. Uh, there's other steps involved. Uh, I personally didn't really care about making the levels. I just wanted to play other people's levels. Yeah. So what you do is you you patch your ROM file. Mm -hmm. So you make your own uh mb64 rom and there's a there's a, like a website that teach, that shows you how to do all this mm -hmm. it's a little faq page then you have to find the directory it's like a little it's basically like a little folder that uh this rom creates yeah and you can download other people's levels and put them in in the in the folder that was a little bit of a pain they has to figure out also, your computer is probably going to assume it's a virus because just because yeah. the way that it opens and you have to turn off your firewall to get it to work. Mm. Uh, that took a, a little bit of tomfoolery, a little bit of tinkering. But eventually, we figured it out. And then there's this website you can go to. Uh, I already forgot the name of it. Here it is on screen. Uh, level, levelsharesquare.com, I think, is the name of the, of the website. And you literally just download levels. It gives you the file. You just put it in that folder, and then you're and then you're ready to to play. So I just downloaded like a million levels and just put them all in. And I believe you can do all of that and put it on a flash cart and run it on original hardware. But there's a few extra steps involved that they have on their FAQ that you could figure it out. But for the most part, it's custom levels in Mario 64, and it's pretty awesome. It runs in widescreen because Parallels allows for that. Uh, you still have the shitty camera, which kind of sucks, but right. it is what it is. Uh, and it's great. It's all the same assets. There's some assets that seem like they're added, but they're, they're not too much. Um, and each level has like a couple of stars usually in it. Some levels have red coins. Some levels have a certain amount of regular coins that you can collect. Uh, there's different, uh, I guess, uh, goals you can you can do in, yeah, in the yeah. level and if you press start it'll tell you everything that you need to do in the level and they're really creative and good it just like really it just feels like an extension of mario 64 cool so uh i encourage everybody to try it if you feel like messing around with parallels launcher because that is a little bit of a barrier to entry now what it now i know like the thing everyone's thinking of is is would nintendo take this down so Nintendo can do whatever they want. Right. 
which is what's most upsetting. The, the old saying was, and I don't know how much water this holds anymore, but if Nintendo intends on using uh, f- that property or that idea mm-hmm. for a future game, then that then they will shut it down. That's why another Metroid 2 remake was shut down because they were making right. their own Metroid remake. This seems like something Nintendo could easily do. A 3D Mario Maker. Yeah. You know, everybody thought this is what Mario Maker 2 was going to be. Yeah, so I think Mario Maker 3 will be Mario Maker 3D. Okay. So it depends on how whether or not they determine that that's too close yeah. to this. But I don't think it is. I think this is Mario 64 Builder. You know, right. this is something... Theirs would probably be have like a 64 skin and a Sunshine skin and a Galaxy skin. Yeah, so... I think it's different enough. Uh, they might not think that, but uh-huh. in terms of actual legality, I don't see the problem at all because you need a copy of the game in order to use this yeah. at all. Uh, it, it, it just gives you a file that, that patches. It, it, it basically hacks your Mario 64 so that you can make levels. Uh, and then you download other people's levels, but you again need the game you need yeah. your own rom in order to play those other people's games so i don't know how they would go about uh uh like the legal reasons i guess if they have a copyright for something that's extremely similar and they don't want people to confuse the two mm-hmm. but it's just a it's it, it's just a rom hack that that seems perfectly legal to me Probably not in Japan. I'm sure in Japan oh, they, yeah. they'd be able to take this down in a heartbeat. But here in America, I don't think there's anything wrong with this. All right. Uh, DJ Kento says, there's no way there's not a team working on this. Uh, yeah, I think that, again, there's probably going to be a 3D Mario Maker that has a style that's Mario 64. I mean, yeah, I'm sure like Nintendo is R&D. They're all, you know, researching and developing a lot of things that we don't know about. Yeah. I'm sure this is one of them. Yeah, I'd be shocked if the next Mario Maker doesn't have 3D in, yeah. in some capacity. But anyway, I think it's really cool. You should try it if you feel like messing around with parallels and if you have your own copy of the Mario 64 ROM. Uh, it's really not that difficult. The only thing that was a little bit of a pain in the ass was figuring out how to open the folder to get other people's levels into your game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you'll figure. My, my big sticking point was that my computer thought it was a virus. Uh... But that's part of like the FAQ. It tells you like to, to whitelist it in your firewall or whatever. Last C10, thank you for the Prime subscription. I very much. How's you? Big? No, just no. Farmer Gooch still. Okay. Uh, next news. Uh, what do you want to talk about next? I can I um, I didn't sort these in any way. Uh, you want to just go? down the line why don't we go straight to retro are coming to apple tv because that's okay. relevant yes that is in our wheelhouse where oh, is I'm, it? I'm moving it up okay it is it has been moved up okay uh f- may 15th the latest gaming emulator for iphone and ipad has arrived on the ios app store retro arc brings its uh brings with it an abundance of supported game systems ranging from nintendo favorites like the n64 snes game boy and ds to sony's playstation and psp sega consoles and more retro arc has previous previously been available on pc and mac but due to apple's previous guidelines for the app store it was never able to come to the ios devices until now the app serves as a front end for a wide variety of game consoles and emulators with broad support for many uh, favorite systems such as uh, Atari 2600, 5200, 7800, Bandai Wonderswan, Commodore Systems, DS, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, NES, N64, Super NES, Virtual Boy, Neo Geo Pocket, Genesis, Saturn, PlayStation, and PlayStation Portable. The above list covers many of the most popular sports systems, but it's not all uh, it's not at all comprehensive. Ret- uh, RetroArch covers a wide gamut of systems, many of which I've never even heard of, according to this uh, writer. Uh, RetroArch comes equipped with a full uh, MFI controller support, so you can use your favorite con- uh, Bluetooth-, Bluetooth controller to play games on iPhone or iPad. Um, something this article doesn't mention, which I think is even more important, is that RetroArch is also available on Apple TV on tv os yeah that's what you that's what you titled this that's what i i mean I'll and, then, be and then i was like did it not come to ios I'll, I'll be honest like this is one of those i put in the keep first 
uh, Retro Rock comes to TV up to Apple TV, and then I Googled an article right. and I just picked one and ran to Right. No, but I'm glad it came That's to both. That's what we do our research. Yeah. Coming to both is good. Mm-hmm. I, I was afraid that it was only Apple TV. No, it's yeah, it's on it's on both. I downloaded it on Apple TV and my phone. Haven't tried it on Apple TV yet. I've tried it on my phone. I don't think I will be using it on my phone anymore. <laughs> it is very complicated, very intimidating. Retro Arc sucks. Have you tried Delta? Yes, Delta is Delta is great. Delta is easy. Delta. I wish Delta would add uh, Genesis and Sega consoles. That's annoying. Um, yeah. But you know, Delta is very good. So Retro Arc, I said it sucks. It's great because it allows you to play all of these games. Yes. But uh, it's old. The UI is old, uh, and there's a lot of settings that are great if you like to tweet tink, tinker around with stuff. But I just want to get in and start playing yeah. the game the best way possible. And Delta makes it so much easier. Yeah. Uh, also, I think the same day. Uh, yeah. PPSSPP, which is a PSP emulator. Yes. Uh, was uh, also. Uh, uh, it also dropped on iOS. Uh, so a lot of people were, you know, like tagging me in this and, and, ask, and asking me about it and stuff. Retroarch on iOS is great. If you're going to play any Nintendo systems, I would still highly recommend Delta because it's just way easier to use and, and it does everything that you want it to do yeah. and everything's fine. Uh, use RetroArch for anything else that you want to play. Like if you want to play Genesis, go ahead. If you want to play anything that Delta doesn't play, you're going to have to get RetroArch and it'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if there's any like front ends that happen, but I don't know how iOS works with like having an <sighs> app launch another app. Yeah. So that might be weird. That's one of the great things about RetroArch is getting a front end to use RetroArch. Like that's what I mm-hmm. do on my handhelds. Like I have, uh, I'm working on one right now. I have Daiji Show as the front end, so it's like, what system do you want? And you go DS, and then it brings up all your DS games, and then you click on one of the DS games, and then it opens up RetroArch. So you don't right. have to look at RetroArch until you want to play the game. Maybe they can implement like skins to it. Like they'd have to. So that's the thing. RetroArch has skins, but they're all still shitty. Right. It's not as good as having like a full on front end. Right. Really, I, RetroArch needs to change. Yeah. Like, like they, they've done a lot. Like, like they have great emulation quality. Yes. They have a lot of great core support, but yes. their UI is fucking garbage. It reminded me of like watching like a movie from the 90s or early 2000s, like uh, what hackers look at, <laughs> like movie hackers. Like, that's what it looked like to me. Yeah. People are saying MU deck. MU deck would be incredible on iOS, but I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what. Again, I don't know what it's like to have an app open another app. Also, too, like this is such a new, you know, frontier for app development. We don't know like the ins and outs of trying to get emulators to work on iOS, let alone be released on iOS. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of things that need to be done yeah i mean a lot of these apps already existed on ios through like uh back channel stuff back channel yeah. stuff and, and retro is one of the retro arc runs on everything yeah uh so it's gonna be a bit before we get like a, a real nice emulation setup on yeah. on uh, ios uh but we were talking the other day about uh apple tv emulation yeah so uh, i want to see how that works everybody always tells me or, or asks me about uh emulation on the tv like 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 i don't want a handheld i want to play it on on the tv and i'm always like just get a handheld and plug it in i don't like yeah there's a lot of like mini pcs and stuff that you can plug in but they're just as expensive as the handhelds you might as well just get the hand yeah uh now if you have an apple tv that might be the best it might be yeah i mean the best emulation set apple tvs are like what 150 like i don't know i didn't didn't even look i'm trying to think i think i think they're about 150 so, and, you know, these handhelds can be around 150, 200. Oh, I'm sorry. There's Apple TV and then there's the Apple TV. <laughs> so Apple.com. <laughs> yeah, no, but there's, okay, you go to the app, you type in Apple TV and it gives you Apple TV. Apple TV Plus. Yeah. You need the device itself. Yes. See, this is the so problem. So let me type in the device itself. <laughs> I mean, don't be mad at me because Apple named their streaming service after their the set-top box. They named the service after the thing. Yes. It's $130? Oh, is this, wow. Is this the, the one? I believe That's so. That's extremely cheap. Yeah. I'm curious to know what emulation cores it can 
do up to. I'd imagine that it's not very powerful. I don't know because what um what chip is it running? It, it's running an iPhone. Chip. It runs on an iPhone chip, so it's not you know it's not going to be the most A15 Bionic. How old is that? By the 128 gig one, it has Ethernet and a great chip. Okay, let's see when that even is. Oh, oh, I see. Wi-Fi plus Internet. It's 150 bucks. Yeah, but that's it, still really cheap. Yeah, and the thing is, both versions have the uh, the A15 Bionic. That's pretty old. Yeah. A15. Yeah, that's pretty old. I'd imagine that could play GameCube just fine. A15 Bionic debuted with the iPhone 13. That's not that old, actually. Now that 2021. That's really not yeah, bad. Yeah, no. That's not bad at all. Yeah. Right. Bob just came up with his next video. I mean, it's going to be a while till I actually get to do this, but yeah, uh, yeah man. But Apple limits apps on t- Apple TV to use just a little bit of space inside each app. Oh, well, I mean, you just put the ROMs in the files app. That's how you do it with Delta. Well, so as far as I've gotten with uh, RetroArch on Apple TV, I downloaded it. And I booted it up, and what it does is the the front screen uh, uh, tells you to go to a website to upload your ROMs into. Oh, yeah, because there's the thing with the the thing with the Apple TV is there's no there's no way to like upload like put a USB stick in and like upload your own yeah. files. Like it all has to be done wirelessly. Can you somehow. use Dropbox? There's no Dropbox app on Apple TV. Interesting. Even like VLC, you have to set up a media server in order to use VLC. So RetroArch makes you go to a website. Yeah. Is it a RetroArch website? I don't. I wish I could remember like what it says. I need to know what that is. Yeah. Like that sounds interesting. That's well, probably going to be a huge pain in the ass to get all yeah. your stuff over. If, I, if, I, get a, if I get a free moment, I'll try to like look at it and like actually like see what you have to do. Okay. Yeah. Because I have it. I have it on my t- on both my living room TV and my bedroom TV. So I'll try to... F- futz around with it yeah this will be a future video for sure i just mm-hmm. don't know when i'm actually gonna be able to get my hands on it and do it uh there's no file browser no, that's it yeah that sucks because then once you get all the games on there then what <laughs> <laughs> i know then they're stuck on there that's yeah. why i don't like why apple's annoying for this shit like i will say though best set top box i've ever used honestly like as for like movies and shit great perfect for like, uh, I like the Chromecast. I'm having a great I time with like the Chromecast. It's too slow for me. Like this one it's just a little works. Slow. And well, I got a nice fancy Chromecast. Okay, I got I got the fancy one. It's pretty nice. Okay. Came with a remote. Nice. Pretty, Those pretty, are nice. Pretty yeah. good. But all I do is I just cast YouTube to it yeah. anyway. That's all I do. So anyway, uh, that's that. Now you yeah. got uh, RetroArch on Apple TV and your iPhone. Yeah. You'll have a good time. Yes. You got a billion uh We're living in the it. golden age of emulation. I think you could probably try uh GameCube. It probably even, won't be good. Like even though the JIT isn't there. Yeah, you, you won't have yeah. JIT. You'll be JITless. Yeah. So you'll try it. All right. Uh I still have a button for this. Backlog! 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 What's up, everybody? It's backlog time. Will, what is the backlog? Backlog is a segment of our podcast, the uh, Wolf Den Podcast, where we go through our backlog of video games. Every game we've ever bought goes into an Excel spreadsheet uh, and that we use to catalog over 30, no, 40 years of games because I'm I'm going to die Jesus soon. Christ. <laughs> Every game we've ever bought goes into an Excel spreadsheet. Today, we're going to pick one at random and talk about it regardless of whether or not we've played it. How many games do we have? Uh, we updated the list recently. We are at like nine hundred and fifty nine. So I haven't added uh, a lot of Switch games. But okay, we're at two forty nine. Two forty nine, and that is Bomberman sixty four, the Japanese version. Okay, wait. Okay, there's a lot of Bomberman. There's a lot. There's. Of, there's I think in a. It's in, very in annoying North America. And we got like three Bomberman games on the N sixty four, whereas in Japan they got like fifty. Yeah, but they're named. They got different they got things. Two Bomberman sixty four twos over there. Yes, yes. So, what is this one? 
I have here, it's labeled Bomberman 64 brackets Japan. <laughs> I don't know if that means uh, it's Bomberman, the Japanese version of Bomberman 64, or it's a special version of Bomberman 64 okay, ho hold on. made for Japan. We're going to go through this list. We got <laughs> Bomberman 64, which released everywhere. Then we have Bomberman Hero. Okay. If that released everywhere, different game. Yes. Then we have Bomberman 64, The Second Attack, which released in Japan and America. And that yes. is Bomberman 2. Yes. But then, in December of 2021, Bomberman 64 launched for the Nintendo 64. <laughs> so, what... Jap J Japan only four player support unrelated to the 1997 title of the same name. So what the fuck? Why do I we don't, have? I don't remember. I'm trying to. We definitely don't have that. I don't know. Do we? <laughs> Bomberman. Bon Bomberman. 64. Japan. Images. It's giving me the one we allegedly don't have. I I think the one that we have is just that one. This cart. Yeah, that looks okay. familiar. Yeah, okay. that, which is just regular Bomberman which is, 64. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I, we're, we're, okay. we're good. All right. We figured, we figured it out. out. We have the, we figured it out. The, fir the first Nintendo 64 Bomberman game, Bomberman 64, the Japanese version of it. Um, I we're we're eighty five percent sure yes. that that's the, we're that's gonna the assume one that we have. it's that and yes. not issue a correction. <laughs> I'm trying to pull up the gameplay now. Uh, I really like the Bomberman sixty four games. Yes, uh, uh, Bomberman. There's not much you can actually. Hey, you know what? This is the Japanese one. There you go. There's uh, not a lot of um, variation you could do with Bomberman. <laughs> no. Uh, although I think Bomberman Hero. Like tried to be a little bit more of a platformer type of Bomberman game. Yes. This one is like a traditional grid based blow shit up Bomberman game. Yeah, and I liked this a lot. I yeah. think I think we rented it a lot. Yes. Because yeah. you know, Bomberman's cool. We we like Bomberman a lot. Yeah. We were big fans of Bomberman on the Sega Genesis. Yes. Uh I've been liking the Game Boy games recently. Game oh, Boy yeah? games are very nice. There's side scrolling ones that act like regular bomb it's side scrolling, but the bombs place in the same way that they do when you're top down. Interesting. It's, it's pretty cool. Are those the that's not the Bomberman Max games, right? Because I know I think those are RPGs. I think the Bomberman Max games are RPGs, but they're still level based. Okay. It, it's a it, it's weird. Yeah. Uh I I'm thinking of Pocket Bomberman. Got it. Okay, yeah. Uh, but this is Bomberman 64. Yes. Uh, it still levels, but like you said, it's a, it's sort of a grid system, but the, mm -hmm. the levels, uh, are big sandboxes that, yeah. that you have a lot to do and, and, and go about with. Mm -hmm. Um, I played a little bit of this recently. I don't remember why. Um, but I enjoyed it for the same reason I enjoy all the other Bombermen. They're yeah. all kind of the same. Right. Well, I mean, the big... It's like a, it's like a big puzzle. Yes. Uh, but the big, like, the reason why I like Bomberman, or the big selling point for me, at least, is always the multiplayer of Bomberman. They, they've always had great multiplayer aspects. Mm -hmm. um, and this one, I mean, it was the first one in full 3D. So, like, you get all these new abilities and ways to, like, attack your friends. But still keeping that, like classic bomberman like grid that yeah. you have to like you know find your friends and stuff yeah they did uh multiplayer with the one on the nintendo switch and that was kind of fun yeah uh and then they they released an only multiplayer version i didn't they? of bomberman r yeah bomberman r online wasn't it and then it like had like YouTube gaming integration and shit, <laughs> and, and you could play with like a million people. Right. Yeah. They 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 tried to go down that that route. I think there's plenty of room for more Bomberman stuff. Oh, uh, absolutely. I'm saying that there's not a lot you can do with the formula, but there definitely is there a lot, you can, is a lot you can do with the formula. It's yeah. just they didn't do much with the formula. They kind of no. kept it the same. 
through all the millions of different through, like, Bomberman games that they have, they to, all kind of yeah. work the exact same Possibly way. to its detriment, too. Yeah, I mean, definitely like, to its detriment because it got boring after a while. Once yeah. you got here, we're in 3D now. There's a lot more you can do yeah. with Bomberman, and it's fucking the same game it's always been. <laughs> and, like, Bomberman's a game like Tetris where, like, technically you can play any one and get the same experience. Mm hmm you know, you might have your favorite version of the game, but like you can tell anybody, like you know, just pick a Bomberman game. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be that way. It, it could, I know it could, it could change it up a little bit. Like mm -hmm. this has, uh, this has camera angles. Yeah, but like you could give me a little more. You can make it like actual 3D. You know. Yeah. I don't know. So I like I like this a lot. I mm -hmm. think it's worth playing. I, I think you should. Uh, try it if you haven't it's definitely great for emulation i I have it on all of my handhelds yeah um but it, it, it could have been it could have been more it could have been a lot better yeah but, uh, I, I liked it at the time it's good to go back to now but there's just not much in it uh and i think i got in my own head because i like bomberman a lot and i like the character a lot and i used to like it when i played it so when Bomberman R was one of the launch titles on Nintendo Switch. I was super stoked about it. Yeah. Because I was excited to get back into Bomberman. But it, it ended up being the exact same game that we've had for 30 years already. Mm -hmm. um, so, why did I buy this game? I think I just liked the uh, Japanese cover art. Yeah. And I think the Japanese one is usually cheaper. Yeah. They, they usually... They're, it's just the way it is. Like, Japanese versions of, like, Nintendo games are because i think they make more over there they do yeah so i think this is another one of those games that i got at the game store that we filmed the backlog uh video game trading posts video game yes. trading posts. i think i got it at video game trading okay. posts. uh i like it i i guess we don't have the uh no english version at all no we don't have the english version next time i'll have to get the other Japanese Bomberman 64. I got to put that on my <laughs> list now. Yeah. Then we can have both. But anyway, give it a try. It's, it's worth playing around for a little bit. If mm -hmm. you uh, get bored of it, then stop playing. And then that's it. Yeah. So that's it for the backlog. You never played this? No, we used to no, rent I've, it all I've the time. I played it. I mean, I didn't, I haven't played it like in like, what is it? 30 years at this point. Yeah. So it's just not a lot to it. I know. That, I mean, like I said, that's the problem with most Bomberman games. Anyway, thanks for watching the Backlog, guys. We'll see you later in another episode of the Backlog or on a podcast. Bye. Bye. Okay. All right. Next news. What do we got? We got, uh, will Call of Duty come to Game Pass? Question. Call of Duty will come to Game Pass. Uh, Microsoft has reportedly decided to add the next installment of Call of Duty to Game Pass. Uh, Wall Street Journal reports that Microsoft will announce the Call of Duty is coming to its uh, game subscription service at the company's Xbox showcase on June 9th. Uh, it was reported earlier this month that Microsoft had been debating whether to put new games of Call of Duty on, on Game Pass, uh, with concerns from some at the company that the revenue generated from a typical Call of Duty release uh, would be undermined by Game Pass. Activision traditionally sells copies of Call of Duty for around $70 or more, selling more than 20 million copies on average. The brief Wall Street Journal report doesn't make it clear whether Microsoft plans to charge extra for Call of Duty inside of Game Pass, nor whether the company will raise its Game Pass subscription uh, fee. Uh, it is understood that Microsoft has been considering raising the Game Pass ultimate pricing again. Activision is currently targeting a late October release of the next Call of Duty, which is rumored to be set during the 90s Gulf War. Microsoft will also hold a big Xbox Summer Showcase on June 9th uh, with a special Call of Duty Direct after the main show ends. It is understood that Microsoft is currently planning to announce a new Gears of War game at the show. The showcase will also include a number of releases, uh, release dates for upcoming games like Flight Simulator 2024, Avowed, and Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. We talked about this last week, didn't we? We talked Well, we talked about what they said in the article, how Microsoft is debating whether or not to put Call of Duty on game Pass. yeah now it looks like they're going to do it they have to do it or yeah. else they have to change the model that they sell game pass on but well if, from judging from that article and the next article i put in the keep they might be doing that xbox will make changes to game Let's pass read the next article Call right of Duty. uh wall street journal last week the wall street journal claimed according to its sources that uh that this year's entry call of duty yet to be official name will be added to the subscription service 
Um, however, Industry Insider Shinobi602 has claimed that on recent era that the addition of Call of Duty to Game Pass will also give Xbox the opportunity to refresh the structure accordingly. One user on the forum predicted that there would be a price increase for Game Pass, while another added, uh, for sure, they want the new signups they get from Call of Duty to be the new f to be the new fee to be on the new fee and will probably reorganize the tiers to be a less confusing mess than it is now. While Shinobi 602 didn't spec uh, specifically confirm a price increase or a tier restructure, they did say there will be changes. Yes. Uh, Call of okay. Duty's inclusion on the service was a long held sticking point uh, in the protracted court battles between Act Activision and Xbox. Uh, Mecha Dragon in the chat says, I'm mad this was up for speculation. They said every first party game is coming to Game Pass. Yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you why it was up for speculation. Uh, because they've lied about every first party. Uh, they've yeah. lied about the first party games going day and date to Game Pass before. So <laughs> nobody believes them anymore. Other people also think that taking Call of Duty and putting putting it on Game Pass is going to lose them money because so many people buy Call of Duty every year. It's yeah. such a big seller. Yeah. Um. So people think that they have to do something in order to recoup those costs. And it's looking like they might increase the price yeah. of Call of Duty. Some people are saying that there might be a different tier or call like a Call of Duty tier. Yeah. Like they might keep the Activision Blizzard games like as a separate thing. You know, like you yeah. pay, pay two dollars more and you get the Activision that Blizzard games. That is insane. I, I I think they have to do some sort of restructuring right now because uh they're already not able to keep up with the promises they've made already about Game Pass. Well, Game Pass is plateaued. The people who yeah. want Game Pass subscriptions have Game Pass subscriptions. The people who don't don't have them. So they got to find ways to like make this thing profitable. So I would argue that just having Call of Duty part of Game Pass would increase game pass subscriptions anyway yeah period mm -hmm. because it's a much better value to get game pass than it would be to just buy call of duty and also too that's not even considering the fact that like most people are playing call of duty now on playstation and pc so pull that up on the, I, I pulled up all of my porn on the computer okay uh <laughs> at least it wasn't the weird stuff so they're they're gonna make a lot of revenue from the playstation sales and the pc sales but you know, they're still leaving a lot of money on the table from the Xbox sales because, you know, people who want it will get the Game Pass subscription. Yeah, but, but that's they, great, but though. But that they won't necessarily keep a Game Pass subscription. You know, they'll pay, right. they'll pay for the month, they'll get their Call of Duty fix, and if they're somebody who likes to play multiplayer, then maybe they'll keep it. Otherwise, they'll, you know, they paid $11 for Call of Duty and that's it. But the reason why the whole industry is switching to subscription models is because people forget about the subscription or they feel pressured into getting the whole year of the subscription. Right. So you end up paying more than you would have if you just bought the one game. But at the same time, like I feel like people are getting much more savvy about this stuff because you look at, you know, people are already subscribed to like Netflix and Hulu and Max yeah. and Disney and all this other crap. And like they're, they're cutting back on what, you know, movie streaming services they have. The same thing's going to happen with games. Yeah, people get annoyed that the subscriptions cost so much. Yeah. But imagine if you're a PlayStation user or look. Like, yeah, imagine if you're a PC user, right? Mm -hmm. You're buying all your stuff on PC and then you got to buy the next Call of Duty. Well, I could buy the game or I could get the subscription to Game Pass. Then right. you get the subscription to Game Pass. Now you have the subscription. Now you're on Xbox's platform. Mm -hmm. Next time a game comes out, you're going to be more likely to play it on Game Pass because you have the subscription already. You don't have to buy it again. Mm -hmm. And that could slowly move people over to the Xbox platform. But will it be enough to keep the Xbox platform sustainable? I right don't... Just like that's that's the question. That, that's the debate of whether or not to release uh, Call of Duty on Game Pass. That's what the, was at the core of the issue here. I is think it, that would get new people over to Game Pass. Will it be enough new people for Game Pass to be financially uh, viable? That's the question here. Uh, that I don't know because I don't know what would be successful for Game Pass. Right. There's, there's just so much shit on there. The, I, yeah. I, I have no idea. We I know that they're doubling down over and over again on Game Pass. Right, but like, we still don't really know. Like, they say Game Pass is a success, but, you know, like I said before, the subscriptions have plateaued. Yeah. There's no, like, new people coming in and there's no people, like, leaving. You know, Hi-Fi Rush, they said, was a big hit and hit all our metrics, but apparently wasn't successful enough. So that's the thing, is that 
I think there is a world where they could put Call of Duty on Game Pass and then J- Game Pass is just successful because of that. And right. that's it. That's all you need to do is put Call of Duty there. Keep doing everything that you've been doing and everything's fine. But Microsoft has shown time and time again that they kind of like mince their words. They 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 lie a little bit and and, and things aren't the way that they say that they are like with hi-fi rush <sighs> yeah saying that that's a successful game and then all of a sudden scrapping the, the or saying that we need games like this and then scrapping the whole company mm-hmm. or saying that games will release day one on game pass and then releasing them three days early if you pay extra money that's not what game pass is supposed to be yeah so i think that they're not happy with the game pass model right now and that's why starfield released three days early or whatever the yeah. fuck and I think that come this uh, come this Xbox event, they're going to announce a lot of weird changes to Game Pass. Yeah. And the way that it works. So I think that it's going to end up, there is going to be that weird disparity between Microsoft games and Call of Duty or Activision or yeah. something. It'll be somewhere else. I don't know. But it, people are going to not like what's gonna happen in, yeah in june is, is what my prediction is yeah no i think i think you're right i think there's gonna be a lot of like they're gonna try and spin it in a way that like sounds positive but it's it's not like it's not looking good for the yeah. xbox brand as it were um this segment i think there's plenty of room for a subscription model yeah to work in their favor there should be plenty of room for not only a subscription model but another video game console out there you know, to compete with Sony and Nintendo, but it seems like they take a step forward and then a step back with their decision making over there. Yeah, it, uh, it, I mean, they're trying something different with this subscription model, but yeah, uh, I don't know for whatever reason they're not. Uh, uh, I su- mean, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna read Sui Kagura in the chat says, but for fuck's sake, the math don't add up. If you subscribe to Game Pass to play Call of Duty, a sixty dollar game for a year, it's seventy. Uh, do you actually spend that much money on just one game? No, you won't be buying five to six games. Game Pass doesn't make sense on its own. It's just to try and reel users in. Yes, it's to get people over to their platform because they don't have people on their platform. Right. It's just like selling a console at a loss. You're getting people locked into your thing. That's the reason that Game Pass would work in their favor. Even right. just having users on your platform is worth a lot of money. But, That's why people spend so much money just getting people's email addresses. Yeah. But at the same time, like uh, Game Pass is only available on PC and Xbox and xbox is like in dead last in terms of the console space yeah so having it like you know confined to one console really isn't doing them any favors here you know if it was on multiple systems if it was on switch if it was on playstation then maybe you start to see like a little more value in the product well i could see it doing some weird thing on switch i can't see it doing that on playstation playstation would not want well i mean i don't know what it would do on switch i don't think they want that either because they want people to buy games these other competitors are going to want you to buy the game through that let's not forget nintendo does have a like an on-demand streaming games platform uh, via switch online Mm -hmm. but those are all older games those are all you know, not, you know, I hate to use this term, but they're not high priority games. You know, you're not getting day and date games. These are games that like, you know, they can afford to essentially give away for free with a subscription service. With Microsoft, you know, their whole selling point, regardless of how, you know, to the letter they follow it is new games, modern games, games released day and date with um, wide release. You know, and those are and those are the games that really need as much money as possible coming in, you know, as opposed to Super Mario Brothers for like the seventh but what, time. What's the difference between this having a subscription service like this and just having a a a, a first party title that's locked to a console? You have a subscription service that's locked to a console, or you have your first party game that's locked to a console. Because the difference is you're either making seventy dollars a sale or $11 a sale. 
Yeah, but there, no, there's yes. a lot of people who just buy one game a year. And also, can you even get Game Pass for one month? I'm pretty sure yes. they try to force you into no, a year. Target's currently selling like Game Pass for a, well, no, like they're selling Game Pass uh, subscriptions for like actually a really good deal. I think three months is only thirty five bucks. I remember when Halo Infinite came out. And everybody yeah. just bought the dollar and just played Halo Infinite for a dollar, and that was great. But uh, they got rid of that almost immediately. Probably, also, they probably, get probably because everybody was buying it to play Halo Infinite. Yeah. And nobody was buying Halo Infinite. They get rid of the the like the premium. Whenever there's like a deal on Game Pass, yeah. right before a new game comes out, they get rid of that deal. Yeah, uh, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate Subscription Digital uh, is currently on sale at Target for twelve dollars for one month. For one month, three month is on sale for thirty five dollars. Mm -hmm. So right now, if you buy four three month passes uh, from Target, it is less than a year subscription of Game Pass. I got news for you: you can currently join for one dollar. For how long? How long is that one dollar? Fourteen days, and so, it, and it says it's usually then it's seventeen dollars a month. Yeah, for ultimate. Oh, that's PC ultimate. Hold on. Oh, the ultimate is everything. Yeah, yeah. So, but the thing is here is that you put your credit card in for the dollar, and then they auto bill you for the next month. Yeah. And I'm telling you, people don't remove their credit cards they just pay over and over again no i know there are people who do but I, there are also people who are becoming more conscious uh, conscious of the fact that they're paying too much for these services. companies know that 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 people leaving their information there for you to suck the money out of their mm -hmm. account is worth more than a one-time 70 dollars purchase otherwise they wouldn't be doing this I don't I don't know. I don't necessarily agree with that because, you know, you're hearing all these stories like on the other end about how like, you know, streaming is losing billions of dollars for these movie companies because the old model of, you know, release a movie in theaters and then release it on home video and then sell the TV rights. That was in place for decades for a reason, because that worked well. And then the streaming model upended all of that and but it was riding high for two years because of the yes. pandemic and then it crashed well even before the pandemic everyone was saying streaming is ruining movies because uh everybody's just staying home and 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 watching them on their tv but and that was great we were like they got to release movies day and date on streaming so i don't have to go out but then these streaming companies started making shittier and shittier movies <laughs> and doing dumber and dumber shit and splintering out and making too many subscription services. Yeah. They ruin themselves. Yes. It's not that the subscription model doesn't work. It's that they fucked it all up. And, and Xbox is doing the exact same thing. Yes. They're, they're fucking it up for themselves. Yes. It's not the fact that it's a subscription model that is the problem. But the problem is that they're coming out here and saying, this is the value of Game Pass. Oh, except none of that is real. That's what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, the, the danger of the subscription service, mm -hmm. you know, they are do they are, you know, they're selling it really well, but they're also repeating all the same mistakes that like all these other subscription services yeah. do. So, you know, right. they, they, I agree with you. Yes. It, it's just my, my point is that it can work and there's room for it to work. Right. But they're just not doing they, yeah. They've, they've been. I've been on their side for so long, and it's so hard to it be on this. It almost makes you think that, like, what anymore. Sony's doing with, like, PlayStation Plus is nowhere near as good as Game Pass. I yeah. want to make that explicitly clear. But their decision to withhold games from going on to PlayStation Plus until, like, well after seems to be the more viable option financially. Because you get the initial rush of sales in the beginning, and when the title, like, loses some momentum then you put it on your subscription service to yeah. try and get people in so microsoft has a problem where they just don't have a lot of people on their platform yes so they have to do as much as they can to get them on the platform and if microsoft was true to their word from the very beginning of how great game pass was and all of their promises then uh there would be a great value and it would be reasonable to take a little bit of a loss on the one game two game mm -hmm. sales a year to get people on the platform so that the next year you get up people stay on your platform they don't move over to playstation right. you've won the console war yay but they're they've proven to uh not be true to their word they've proven that uh there really is not a great value there yeah so 
it makes it harder for this to make sense. Which is why in June, when they do their announcement, there's probably going to be a lot of changes to Game Pass that are not good. Right. Well, there's more to it than just Game Pass. Okay. This segues nicely into our next article. I want to say Riley Moon in the chat said, this reminded me to cancel my Game Pass subscription. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. So, okay. next article. Lay it on me. All right. Microsoft boss reportedly is pushing for no red line around Xbox game launches on PlayStation. How does that mean? A fresh report into the inner workings of Microsoft and the influence of its top boss, Satya Nadella, uh, has shed new light on the pressure for Xbox to release more of its games on rival platforms in a bid to boost its profits. Windows Central states that the plan to launch more Xbox games on PlayStation and Nintendo consoles, an operation dubbed Latitude, has sparked debate and unease within the company at whether the move makes sense. Publicly, Xbox has suggested it is testing the waters with the four games launched so far, uh, multi-platform titles that could benefit from more players like Sea of Thieves and Grounded, as well as smaller titles that have already reached the majority of their likely audience on Xbox, like Hi-Fi Rush and Peniment. But privately, Microsoft is reportedly pushing for no red line at, uh, at all around which games Xbox will launch on PlayStation and Nintendo platforms in a bid to increase its margins. Eurogamer understands numerous other games are under consideration, including titles in the company's largest franchises. It has been a tough time for the wider games industry and Xbox in particular, with falling console sales and another generation stuck way behind Sony layoffs and game launches that haven't uh, set uh, tills ringing. Last year's uh, $68.7 billion buyout of Activision Blizzard was a huge bet that helped keep Xbox in profit, but also feels like it contributed to a, a cull of smaller Bethesda projects at multiple studios last week in order to better balance uh, the books. Or as Xbox studio boss Matt Booty <laughs> put it, uh, ensure a repo- reprioritization of titles and resources to focus on priority games. So... Uh, I'll just skip down here. Making games multi-platform is another move to boost profits and should not be a surprise moving, uh, not should not be a surprising move following Nadella's uh, past comments uh, that he has no love for console exclusives in the short term. It was unsurprisingly found some financial success, but at what cost? I mean, isn't like one of the most, uh, like one of the most popular apps on Mac computers is microsoft word isn't it yes so like they're no stranger to i think one of the best selling games on uh playstation right now is sea of thieves yeah i mean i hope that playstation sees a lot of success with uh their pc ports and hell divers releasing day one uh Uh, ghost of tsushima is i think like the fourth best selling game on steam ever in the we've talked about how playstation seems to be happy with uh their pc ports in, in previous episodes so and this all makes sense. And again, Microsoft is not doing well with selling consoles. No. So they are a software company. These these games, they they got a million uh, game developers right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of those games would be a lot more profitable if they put them in, on as many platforms as possible. Yeah, I think it would behoove them to honestly just become a third-party publisher. And just start releasing games on everywhere. Because, like, that's the only way they're really going to make profit now. Is if they start releasing games multi-platform. I mean, sure, keep your exclusives. Halo, Gears, Fable, and whatnot. But, like, Indiana Jones should go to PlayStation. Mm -hmm. Elder Scrolls 6 should go to PlayStation. Starfield should go to PlayStation. Like, there's no reason, like, to keep these games locked on your console. Other than, like, some weird sense of pride that you have. There's, There's value to having a platform. Uh, and there's value to having exclusives if you do it the right way, but they have been doing it the wrong way for so long yeah. that uh, they they kind of can't... Like, they bought a lot of developers. They can't re- have all of these developers be exclusives now. They can't, yeah. they can't be like, we're going to have 10 games come out next year and they're all exclusives. Mm-hmm. That's a great way to ruin your company yeah. because people ha- you have no install base. Mm-hmm. And that's not going to all of a sudden get you that install base. Especially because the last couple of games they've they've released haven't been too hot. Yeah. People have not been happy with Microsoft. No. Makes me nervous for Indiana Jones. Yeah. I, I, I would be if I, if I was you. <laughs> um, all right. 
Uh, next news. Let's go right into the big. Oh, we're gonna love this conversation. Uh, oh boy, Ubisoft reveals Assassin's Creed Shadows. It's long-awaited feudal Japan game. Uh, Ubisoft gave Assassin's Creed fans their first look at the next flagship game in the long-running franchise with the debut trailer of Assassin's Creed Shadows. Uh, previously known as Codename Red, Shadows will send the franchise to feudal Japan for the first time this November, letting players live out their shinobi fantasies as the ninja uh, Noe. Noe? I, I, I gotta see how it's spelled out. N-A-O-E. Noe. 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 <laughs> All right, Assassin's Creed Shadows <laughs> will also let users take on a second role, that of legendary black samurai uh, Yasuke. While other Assassin's Creed games have featured dual protagonists, um, the two playable characters of Shadows will appear to be more distinct than those of previous games. The game's female ninja character is shown wielding a uh, ninjato, wrist blade, and a kusarigami. Uh, her samurai counterpart is a heavily armored fella with a hefty katana. The debut trailer for Assassin's Creed Shadows teased a cinematic ambitions and introduced its characters. Fans may need to wait until Ubisoft forward in June for a look at actual gameplay. Uh, see, this is, um, this is where they get me because this looks cool, but it's another Ubisoft game. Yeah. This, uh, I was going to say, I feel like I say this a lot. Yeah. Uh, this is going to finally get me to play a Ubisoft. Uh, I mean, uh, an Assassin's Creed game. I said that last year though, with Mirage. Yeah. Cause I was like, Oh, they're going back to the roots. It sounds like, yeah. no, this is actually going to get me to play yeah. uh, an Assassin's Creed game. Finally, people have been waiting for a Japanese Assassin's since the first Creed for one, a really long time. Just the yeah. first game. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it felt like, uh, like a, like a ninja game. Yeah. So, Assassin's Creed is usually pretty good at uh, dropping you into like a country and 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 giving you a lot of their culture and stuff. Yeah. Um. So they're doing that with Japan here. Yeah. So. And I like how they're they're gonna make the two playable characters distinct. Like I think. Uh, yeah. Now now way is gonna play more like a traditional Assassin's Creed game, whereas Yusuke is gonna play more, more he's like, like a brute. He's gonna play more like the RPG games, like Valhalla and Origins and the Odyssey. Cause really? Apparently, yeah, because apparently, oh. like those two gameplays were like very different from each That's other. That's interesting. Yeah. So, I would like to see how that plays out. Yeah, I <laughs> like know? his story too. Yeah, he's like a a, a foreign samurai. Yeah. I apparently, think that, I he think was in true. Italian slave. Really? And then he just got dumped off in Japan, and then they oh, were wow. like, "This guy's awesome." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give him a sword and teach him the way of the samurai. Nice. So, uh, yeah, I'm, That's in, cool. I'm interested. In yeah. This. Uh, however, of course, there was not, um, actually it's pronounced Yasuke. Yeah, we know. Yeah. Okay. Do I look like I know how to pronounce English <laughs> words, let alone Japanese words? This... He, literally, he literally wrote, um, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that mad. Uh, <laughs> this announcement wasn't without controversy. There was a lot of controversy you, with this. No. Yeah. Guess what, No. Bob? This game's going to require online. Oh, that's <laughs> A single why. player that's game requiring okay. online. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> once again, uh, it's a Ubisoft game. Uh, the disc says on internet connection required. They clarified uh, Assassin's Creed Shadows will not require a mandatory connection at all times. An online connection will be needed to install the game, but you will be able to play the entire journey or offline and explore Japan without any online connection it's the same thing that happened with uh star wars outlaws there's confusion over you know you can get you buy the physical version but you still need an internet connection to play a single player game yeah like, i don't know i feel like this is companies trying to well this is ubisoft so it's yeah. probably the same it's just the same exact thing it's yeah. probably doing the same thing a majority of triple a games require a a, a a day one patch or something to download or something yeah. So this isn't that abnormal, but uh, I think because the, people are more afraid that it's going to require an always online connection to play the game at all. Yeah, because we've seen other games do that. We've seen other Ubisoft games do yeah. that. So it's you know it sucks that we live in a world where we ha they have to clarify that. Yeah. Um, but also this is bad for games preservation. Exactly. Because yeah. 20 years from now uh you just won't be able to play a yeah. Creed Shadows. Like if you pick this if you pick this game up at a convention or whatever or a secondhand store and you try to play it and you're not going to be able to yeah so that that sucks yeah. I, I hope that that's why we need laws in place that make it so that if you buy a piece of software uh if they're going to end the life of that software they need to yeah put something out there to make it so that you can still access that software yeah uh, like right before they decide to stop 
uh, supporting this game, they need to release something that is publicly available that will activate your game for you if you mm -hmm. if you own it. Um, somebody else in the chat mentioned that the game has a really weird pricing structure. I'm not surprised by that. Uh, yeah, you know, didn't Outlaw Star Wars Outlaw? Every Snap every thing? Ubisoft game has dumb pricing. Apparently, structure. it's like 130 dollars. But why? For what? Uh, what does that give you? That I don't the $70 know. Seventy dollar game doesn't give you. Never forget the Watchdogs uh pre-order pricing structure where you need an entire like fucking graph to see like all the different versions of what you got with each uh never forget assassin's creed uh brotherhood or whatever where the we talk about this all the time where the game just left out two missions oh no that was um assassin's creed 2 just straight up two. yeah base game is how much i don't think the base game is 103 dollars. no the base game's got to be 70 dollars I didn't put this in the keep, but apparently, like, uh, THQ is mulling over whether or not to release GTA 6 for more than $70. They can. They could. They and, should not. Well, I would not like it if they did. Yeah. But that's... Okay, it's $70. I don't know what the... I, I don't know what... I, I don't... Oh, there we go. There's, there's all of them. Standard edition, base game, pre-order bonus. Ooh, yay. Gold edition, base game, season pass. We don't even know what that is. Yeah. Three days early access. Woo! Woo! Ultimate edition, base game, pre-order bonus, season pass, three day early access, ultimate pack, whatever the <laughs> fuck that is. Let's see what the season pass even is. Includes a bonus quest on day one. So it, it's literally yeah. Assassin's Creed 2. Uh, with additional unlockable content as well as two upcoming expansions. Okay. I will be getting the base game, and that is it. I will be waiting for this game to go on sale, and then maybe buying it. So, we always use whenever we're. Uh, I've heard the argument about game the pricing of games now. Game like games are relatively cheap. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard arguments that like. A lot of people like to say, like, Grand Theft Auto V is a $60 game, and so is Bomberman R. Like, yeah. those sh should not be comparable. But my, like, my argument for the people who said that with Breath of the Wild as well, yeah. my argument for Breath of the Wild was that that game is a $100 game. Yeah. And I say the same thing for, for Grand Theft Auto. Not that I think they should sell it for that much, but if everyone's bitching about how games cost so much to make, that is the game that costs the most to make. Yeah. But I don't know. Because, like... I don't want it to cost that much. But we, we there, put has, so there much is value, an argument for that. We put so much, like, stock in, like, how much, how much playtime you get out of a game, like, determines its worth. Meanwhile, like, you know, you go to the movies, you go to see Avatar, which is three and a half hours, or you go to see, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Anyone But You, which is, like, 90 minutes... The ticket price is still fifteen dollars for yeah. both movies, so I don't necessarily know if playtime should equal price. No, because we've talked about Portal for fucking thirty years, yeah. and that game was two hours. Right? Yeah, so like, yeah, I don't think time equals value. Yeah, you know, I th I think there's a lot more that goes into it. Yeah, but there are games that you play for like thousands of hours. Mm -hmm. over and over again yeah uh that that give you more and more value all the time i mean how much is stardew valley and people play that game for hours yeah games like 20 yeah. bucks yeah <laughs> valorant is free yeah but i bought a lot of skins oh there you go well, there's gundam skins in call of duty now oh i've so i've seen the ads the ads i'm rad i'm gonna spend some money in call of duty <laughs> All right, next news, uh, ran super random, Nintendo bought a studio. Yeah. This, uh, just, this just dropped on, I saw it on Twitter live when it happened. Yeah. Uh, the Japanese Twitter account, their like business account was like, we acquired a studio. Yeah, Here they were is. like super serious about it. Yeah. Uh, 
There have been all sorts of acquisitions in the game industry recently, and now it's Nintendo's turn. The Japanese company has entered into an agreement with Embracer Group. Dun, dun, dun. Very weird. To acquire the Miami, Florida-based uh, Shiver Entertainment. Shiver has previously worked under Embracer, porting and developing Switch titles like Mortal Kombat 1 and Hogwarts Legacy. Um, in an official statement, Nintendo said it would acquire 100% of outstanding shares of Shiver and make it a wholly owned subsidiary with its aim to secure high-level resources for porting and developing software titles shivers focus will remain the same a post acquisition porting and developing software for multiple platforms including switch uh quote by welcoming shivers ex uh, experience and accomplished uh development team nintendo aims to secure high level resources for porting and developing software titles going forward even after it becomes a part of the nintendo group shivers shivers focus will remain the same continuing commissions that port and develop software for multiple platforms including nintendo switch the acquisition will be completed pending satisfaction of all relevant customary closing conditions according to a footnote the acquisition will only have a minor effect on nintendo's results for the current fiscal year uh shiver entertainment inc was founded in 2012 uh and started by john uh shepherd uh jason anderson and john oswald um, the studio is skilled in both porting and developing of video game software and it has helped shape franchises such as Scribblenauts, Need for Speed, Guitar Hero, and FIFA. It is originally it was originally acquired by Embracer Group in December of 2021. It's interesting that uh Embracer Group let them go. Well, I think Embracer Group is like needs to start selling some things because like yeah. they are hemorrhaging money. They've been selling a lot of companies, so, so I saw uh some uh there's been a lot, of course, there's been discourse online about this. Um, th this company Shiver seems to just just be a porthouse for Nintendo Switch games. Yeah. Uh, all their whole credit is Scribble Knots Showdown, which is a port. Scribble Knots Mega Pack, which is a co co collection of games. Uh, Mortal Kombat 11, which great port. Yeah, very we, good. That's port. a good port. A uh, Hogwarts Legacy, which I heard was a good port. That that was okay. A, that yeah, was I was a, I was curious about that because I. I didn't see any reviews about the Switch version specifically. That was, but the, we kept saying over and over again that that was never gonna come out on right. the Switch. We were like, this is impossible, and then they did. Yeah. They they released it. So, uh, and then Mortal Kombat One, which apparently is not a good, not port. a good port. But I feel like that might have been pushing it. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I saw people online saying uh, that was never gonna be a good port. Yeah, <laughs> like, no matter who did it, it wouldn't. It Fair wouldn't enough. Be yeah. Um, I saw other people saying, why is everybody saying that Nintendo's buying them to port games over? Because there's a footnote on their website that says that uh, Shiver Entertainment is very passionate and, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, wouldn't, like, wouldn't be opposed to making their own games. Well, it seems like the past five fucking games are all ports. Yeah. And all they've ever done is ports. So that's why everybody thinks they're going to do ports. Yeah. And uh it wouldn't be weird if uh, Nintendo bought them uh, to help optimize their own games, but also to be like, hey, Ubisoft, we want Assassin's Creed on uh, on Switch. Let's make a deal. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So now they have an in-house studio that can help other third-party publishers like get their games onto Switch. Yeah. You know, uh, Sony did the same thing. They, they acquired Bluepoint Studios, which had previously made ports for them, yeah. and now they just own them all uh, outright. Um, I mean, they're primarily focused on like remasters of older games, but you know, the principle is the same. It's also not weird for, uh, Nintendo to publish other people's games on their platform. You know, yeah. like that, that happens. So yeah. shit like that happens all the time. Um, so yeah, I think this is largely just to get games to run on the next switch. Probably yeah. to, to get uh, more third party stuff. You'll remember that when the Switch came out, there was like no third party support. Uh, but now everybody wants their games on Switch. Yeah. But you still got weirdos like like EA that doesn't want to try. There's still like a lot yeah. of work that goes into porting your game to the Switch. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's exactly what this is. Yeah. They're acquiring this as a sort of port house. Are they going to port from Switch to new Nintendo console? Probably. I mean, that's probably part of why why they, acqu they acquired Shiver. I don't know if that's for them to do, but uh, right. I'd imagine that uh, there will be tools. I'd imagine that the next Switch can just play everything the original Switch can. Mm -hmm. Just it, whether or not you want to optimize it for 4K or or whatever. Yeah. All right, moving on. Uh, 
are we getting PS2 emulation on our PS5s? Uh, f- which I don't know. Hold what... on, shut the fuck up. Okay, John yes, Crawford with 32 months. Happy anniversary, cute boys. Still loving the channel, though. I haven't <laughs> seen a Will Wolf video in ages. Can we start a GoFundMe campaign to get Will back on YouTube? You can give him money. Yeah, I'll I'll just gladly take your money. Yeah, just give just, him just money. Just give me money. Uh, don't think that hasn't crossed my mind. <laughs> Uh, Brutal Beast, thanks for the 41 months. Hey, Will, did you see the new Planet of the Apes movie? I bought my ticket, so I'm seeing it Friday. I was going to see it last Friday, but bedtime ran long, but I bought my ticket. I am seeing it this Friday. I really want to see it. It looks fucking awesome. Professor Staz, thank you for the four months. Uh, Sony lists, Sony listing hints at native upscaled PS2 emulation on the PS5. Um, and this is a very interesting looking... Uh, PS5 that they have. Yeah. It was, yeah, we'll just read the Ars Technica article. Uh, years ago, Sony started making a select handful of PS2 classics available um, as emulated downloads on the PS4. Now there are signs that certain PS2 games will have similar availability for native download on PS5, complete with new features like up rendering, rewind, quick save, and custom video filters. The hint at Sony's upcoming PS2 download plans comes via the new PlayStation Network listing for the 2002 release of Star Wars The Clone Wars, which recently appeared on tracking site PS the Deals. Um, the site draws from unpublished data from the PSN servers, uh, such as this thumbnail image of the re- that recently appeared on the PlayStation.com servers and a listing plan and a list plan. Uh, blah. I'm okay. Uh, and lists a planned June 11th release for the emulated Clone Wars port. So far, this is nothing out of the ordinary, but near the bottom of, of the boilerplate, the listing notes that this title has been converted from the PS2 version to the PS4 and PS5 consoles and provides newly added features, emphasis added, um, that's marked a different that's a marked difference from earlier PS2 on PS4 downloadable releases, which only say that they were converted from the original PS2 version to the PS4 system. Previous PS2 games released on the PlayStation Classics uh, could uh, could be played on PS5 via the newer system's PS4 backwards compatibility, of course, and those titles already looked relatively decent on modern displays thanks to near HD upscaling at a solid frame rates, but new up-rendering designs uh, for 4K-compatible PS5 could make the the these aging 3D titles look even better on high-end TVs, uh, even if low-resolution textures originally designed for 2000s era CRTs uh, may still look dated. And other new features like rewinds, quick save, and custom video filters promise nice improvements over the relatively bare-bones PS2 emulation found on the PS4. Uh, those same features mod- and modern editions like trophies are also currently offered on select PS1 titles that have been available on PS5 um, that's thanks to the work of Implicit Conversions, a retro-focused porting company that has recently been working with Sony uh, to add PS1 support for uh, to its multi-platform Syrup emulation engine. Uh, so yeah, looks like we could be getting PS2 games on PS5, uh, but this looks like it's probably going to be the, uh, the PlayStation Plus service. Not necessarily that you'll be able to buy these games. Did we not have them already? Apparently not. That's what I thought. And then, like, according, uh, they think the list is mostly just PS1 games and PS3 games. P- PS3, I know, is a big deal because they're all streaming. Yes. As far as I know, it's the top tier. It's PlayStation Plus Premium where you get the PS1 games. I played Ape Escape. Yeah. That's and a- Resident Evil. The PS1, those are PS1 games. Oh, they just didn't have two at all? I don't think so. Get the fuck out of here. Right? Their best selling system? <laughs> you can download the PS2 games on the PS5. So what? Oh, but it's, um, it's the PS4 emulator. So it's not like, it's not like a new version of it. You know, you're basically playing PS4 games via backwards compatibility. It's not PS5 native. So this is just a better emulator is what basically what you're yes. me. it's just a di- it's and it's native to PS5 is not backwards compatible. Oh, a select handful of PS2 classics available yeah. emulated downloads on the PlayStation. Their PS2 games will be similarly available for native download. Okay. Okay. So it's still it's still an emulator. Yeah. And it's not you know, the 
the ability to put in your PlayStation 2 discs into your PlayStation 5 and play that way, I which I think is what we all actually want. It's being natively up rendered, yes, and st and has some native features, but mm -hmm. it's still got to play through an emulator. So I don't, yeah. I hate, I hate this. We're pretending like uh, this is an emulation, or pretending like hardware emulation is an emulation, and all of that shit. It's still, right. you're still pretending like you're a PlayStation Two when you're playing the game. Yeah, I think you know they're trying to like skirt around it by saying like you know it's PlayStation, so it's official PlayStation, you know. Right work and em emulation has a bad reputation because like you know losers in their mom's basements play legend of zelda yeah. on their tv on their pcs or what meanwhile N uh, nintendo is the biggest emulation company in the world yes uh all right half of playstation players still have an upgraded to a playstation 5 i believe this and i've been thinking this and it's hard to i'm glad that there's proof but like you know that not a lot of people have PlayStation 5. Yeah. Just like by looking around. You yeah. know that there's still... It's it's not that it's hard to get anymore, but just yeah. people haven't really found the need to upgrade. Right. And... But then you hear that there's, you know, so many that's sold. Mm -hmm. So it's like hard to... Also, we're in a bubble where everybody just... All of our friends get all the nice, cool, new things. And everybody we talk to in the chat, everybody who's watching this likes to Only keep up with the Only one of my, like, friends stuff. has a PlayStation 5 other than me. I have two friends that have Xbox series, but they've always been Xbox kids. Yeah. So, yeah, like upgrading has not really been like a priority for people that I know in my circle. Yeah, you have to think about the uh, people, the, the extreme casual player. That's most people. Yeah. You know, so why would they want a PlayStation 5? Yeah, why would they want to spend $500 on a big box? When that... their 4 is doing just fine. Yeah, and they're still releasing games for the 4. That's the thing is that most people are just turning on their console to play Fortnite. Yeah. And that's already just fine on mm -hmm. the PlayStation 4. Uh, should I read the article? Yeah, just, All right. yeah, I think it's short. Okay. According to Sony, the PlayStation Network had uh, 118 million active users as of March 31st, 2024. As Game File Steven Totillo points out, the PlayStation 5 install base accounts for exactly half of that total, meaning that the other uh, 559 million uh members must still be using the PlayStation 4. It takes time for people to adopt to new console hardware and the PS5 suffered from a supply shortage early on that didn't help, but laying out the divide between PS4 and PS5 users is in such a clear numbers uh, during what Sony calls the latter stage of the PS5 life cycle puts things into perspective. Uh, Assassin's Creed Shadows will be the first Ubisoft, uh, first game in the Ubisoft series to skip last gen's uh, console since the PS4 went on sale in 2013 meaning that even with that divide, uh, this is the first time Ubisoft has been comfortable leaving old hardware behind for its flagship series. However, Shadows has the luxury of being a multi-platform game that will also launch on PC and Xbox Series X and S. Meanwhile, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Final Fantasy XVI have reportedly not met Square Enix's expectations as a PS5 exclusive. Um, as a result, the company is making concerted effort to release games on multiple platforms moving forward. Uh, so yeah. That's the long and short of it. So is Assassin's Creed coming out before Star Wars Outlaws? No. So is Star Wars Outlaws coming out on PS4? No. Shadows is the first Assassin's Creed game not coming out on last gen system. The first time the Ubisoft, the Ubisoft yeah. series. Though. I thought it was the first time Ubisoft. So why mm -hmm. are we even mentioning it? Because <laughs> it's a big deal. Like... Assassin's Creed is one of those series that like Ubisoft puts on everything under right. the sun because they want, you know, the most people to buy the game. Mm -hmm. But now they feel comfortable enough to leave last gen behind. Did Call of Duty do that? I think they did. Modern Warfare 3 was the last one, right? Yep. I don't think that there I don't think there's a PS4 version of it. No, wait, there is because they did a they did a bundle. There is a PS4. I remember version. seeing a PS4 bundle in Walmart. <laughs> We have been uh, old enough to live through a lot of console life cycles, and we always see uh, the last games on the platform are always Just Dance, Madden, uh, that's it. This... When Call of Duty leaves, it's like, all right, something's wrong here. I feel like this uh, overlap has been much longer than yeah. it had been in the past. No, this is... It, the console life cycles have gotten longer and longer yeah. because the jump between consoles has become less and less uh, 
useful. Like that. Like right. there's, there's not anything that's like, oh, I need to get the new yeah. console. And also too, like you know, you got to factor in games. The the systems themselves, you know, are get much more expensive every generation. Game prices may be relatively you know stable but the systems themselves like the pricing is usually like a hundred dollars more every generation Mm -hmm. and the fact that we're living through like astronomical inflation right now and wages are down and all this shit like people are being much more conservative with how they spend their money so i understand like you know 59 million people may have playstation 5s but the other 59 million aren't in a rush to upgrade yeah uh and and I completely understand why they wouldn't be in a rush to to upgrade. Mm-hmm. Also, like, I mean, there's got to be a way to tell. I feel like we've done this before. How many people even have 4K displays? Like, yeah, that they play their games on. Yeah. I mean, we don't have that, but I'm sure Sony has that. Well, I'm sure that it exists. Yeah, you could find those stats. We, can, you know what? We're gonna do a poll right now on on uh, on Twitch. There sorry, you go. Sorry, YouTube, but we'll, we'll do a poll on Twitch. Um, how do you do a poll? Manage poll. Uh, create a new poll. Uh, why do you use what resolution display do you use for game? Uh, 4K under 4K. I'm just gonna do that. Okay, because. There's like 1440p and right. 1080, and I feel like a lot of people feel like 1440. We'll we'll lump it all together. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll do it for we'll do it for five minutes. I'll get started for a while. All right. Um, if you somebody in the chat says 1080p for PC and 4K for console, if you have both. Just say 4K. Yeah. If you have 4K at all, just vote for 4K. Um, so anyway. Uh, yeah, that's a, that, one of the big things about the new generation was 4K. And I yeah. feel like not a lot of people are playing. Even now, 4K has been out for what, like fucking 15 years? Yeah. And still not a lot of people are, are to, to, to enjoy yeah. their content. Um, so a lot of people play competitive shooters. Uh. There's not a lot of people that play competitive shooters on PC. There's not a lot of people that play PC at all that are playing it in 4K. Yeah. PC game stuff is still 1440 and under because people like the high refresh rate. Yeah. All right, let's plow through the rest of this. Okay. Uh, f- Take Two CEO. Uh, f- there was an earnings call uh, for through Take Two. There was a lot of news that came out of it. Like, you know, Grand Theft Auto 6 will come out next year. They're going to put. Uh, they're going to start releasing uh, sequels to a lot of their franchises and stuff. Uh, but this news article involves Roller Drome, so it's fucking personal. <laughs> uh, earlier this month, Take-Two announced the cost reduction plan um, that included uh, project cancellations, layoffs of 5% of his workforce, and other spending cuts. Admit th- amid this announcement came reports based on internal documentation that seemed to confirm Take-Two was closing uh, Ali Ali World and Roller Drome developer Roll7 and Kerbal Space Program 2 uh, developer Intercept Games. But when uh, Rebecca Valentine of IGN asked Take Two CEO Strauss Zelenik in a call why these closures happened, he said, We didn't shutter those studios. We did not shutter those studios, to be clear. This is a quote from him. And we are always looking at our release schedule across all of our studios to make sure that it makes sense. So we are being very judicious uh, because we are in the middle of a cost reduction program that we've already concluded and are now fully rolling out. Uh, We've announced that we are saving $165 million in existing and future costs, uh, but haven't shuttered anything. What the hell does that mean? The reports, uh, which came uh, both from a Warren Act notice pointed out by game developer and an internal documentation seen by Bloomberg, seems pretty definitive. So this was a surprising response. In an update, uh, Bloomberg reporter Jason Schreier uh, has since uh, shared a snippet of the documentation on Twitter as well. Uh, Valentine followed up by asking Zelenik if he was denying the reports, at which point a PR representative for the company stepped in and said the following. Uh, what we said is in the 8K filing that we put out 
Uh, we talked about the cost reduction plan is approximately 5% reduction in headcount worldwide, but we did not give a label by label breakdown of what that looks like. Uh, Valentine tried what? once. She tried one more time asking if the studios existed or not. PR reiterated that we have not provided any additional color beyond what I just said. So it's just a it's just a straight up lie. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't shutter those studios to be clear. And then they go on to say why they shuttered the studio. Yeah. We didn't show to the studio to be clear. We just fired everybody that's yeah. there as a cost saving measure. That doesn't make any sense. These people don't live in the real world. They don't. It's like scary. It's very scary. Yeah. Like they, 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 we're getting farther and farther away from from these CEOs. Yeah. <laughs> it's the it's disparity baffling. is insane. Like uh, like I understand like you see these people as numbers but like like this is the most callous just answer and like, the question yes. there was a question asked answer it yeah don't don't just, lie about yeah. it the problem is these people find so much success from lying so yeah. much <laughs> anyway uh next Valve's next game, fucking, they're making a game. Wow. Yeah, this is never coming out. Valve doesn't make <laughs> games anymore. Valve doesn't do anything anymore. That's they make true. the Steam Deck. It's amazing that the Steam Deck yes. ever came out. Yes. And and they have a platform where they just take 30% of all games that exist. Yeah. And that's Valve. Yeah. And they have a lot of fun little projects that don't ever go anywhere because there's nobody there to say, let's publish that. Yeah. Um. Valve may have sprung a leak. Uh, uh, a handful of screenshots supposedly from Valve's next big game. Allegedly, a competitive shooter called Deadlock appeared on 4chan and Twitter yesterday. Uh, the word from multiple dedicated Valve sleuths on Twitter is that Deadlock is a 6v6 third-person shooter that takes inspiration from Overwatch, Team Fortress 2, and Dota 2. This mostly confident description of Deadlock are coming from a Gabe follower, a Valve-focused content creator. 6v6 uh, battling on huge maps in uh, with four lanes, usable abilities and items, tower defense mechanisms. Um, he added as of the project yesterday on Twitter. Fantasy setting mixed with steampunk, magicians, weird creatures and robots, fast traveling using floating rails similar to Bioshock Infinite. 6v6 sounds cool. Third person sounds cool. I'm not into Dota or uh, League of Legends or anything like that. Yeah. But if it's like a third person shooter, why not? Yeah. I I'll say... Uh, I'm not a big fan of Overwatch. I like it when it came out a million yeah. years ago, but Overwatch 2, I'm like, I'm just, I just don't think I'm interested in a game like this anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that new Marvel one that came out that's basically Overwatch. Yeah. Marvel Rivals. Uh, I like the idea of that, and then I watched gameplay, and I'm like, this looks boring as fuck. Mm -hmm. It looks just like Overwatch. So if this is like that, I'm not going to be interested. Yeah. But uh, if there's something unique about it, maybe I will I mean, be. maybe. Like, Valve like has a proven track record all of their games that they put out are good you know baseline yeah. um it's just it's a shame that like this is what they're focusing on in like half-life 3 or like games people actually want them to make yeah you know? there's a lot that portal 3 steam can do a lot of great stuff but uh the way that their uh internal structure is it it, it, it doesn't make any sense it isn't a breeding ground for uh progress like they you gotta release a failure every once in a while. Like you gotta, like, you gotta release things. You got, yeah, you gotta release yeah. things. Period. Yeah. Like you know, the legend states that like the the hierarchy structure at Valve is just like we hire you, work on whatever you want to work on. Yeah. Like that's it. But like, what are people working on? Like, yeah. what is being made? Why aren't we seeing things? I mean, I I I like it when a company takes their time and only releases things when they're ready and they're good no i understand but, that but there's a there's a limit yeah like valve goes a little too far yeah they got, there, there's a lot of cool ideas that you see but they gotta release them mm -hmm. you know there's definitely a ton of projects within valve that we've never heard about or seen oh, that, that uh, probably would have been really cool i mean we know there's they've like started and stopped half life three a bunch of times i think now it's officially just like stopped so 
Um, anyway, uh, hey, the uh, poll ended, and it looks like uh, 62% of people are playing under 4K. Wow. So I'm not surprised at that. Okay. Uh, and that's that. So a slight majority for under 4K. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Next news. Uh, Ninja Theory's next game already greenlit. Okay. Senua Saga, Hellblade 2 developer Ninja Theory has oh, reportedly uh, had its next game greenlit, which in which is in addition to Project Mara, which was first announced in 2020. The report comes from Jez Corden at Windows Central and is seemingly in response to people misinterpreting the studio's latest Twitter post in which Ninja Theory studio head uh, Don Matthews thanks fans. Making video games is difficult. Much like Senua, we as a team have been guided by a con uh, conviction to achieve our quest to make a game that sticks uh, assists you deep into Senua's world and to have you uh, on a journey that leaves you thinking and feeling uh, a part of a message read. Uh, in a time of industry mass layoffs and uncertainty, it is not difficult to see why some people came to the conclusion that this message felt like a goodbye. However, according to reports um, that this is nothing more than a warm message from the studio head that, according to their sources, their next game has been greenlit. Corden reiterates that the greenlit project is in addition to Project Mar Mara, which was first announced in 2020. Uh, game's only six and a half hours. Yeah, these games are not uh, long. Might play it. Yeah, I, I might I might just buy it. Yeah, I haven't played the first game yet, but I might just buy it just to make sure, you know, Microsoft doesn't shut down another studio. <laughs> you know, like, that's the big concern because uh, Hellblade 2 didn't have a, any marketing campaign until two weeks yeah. before launch, you know, and, like, it was barely anything at that. Um, and people were really looking forward to this game. So... It's good that their next project got greenlit already. Mm -hmm. So that's a, you know, knock on wood that comes out and it doesn't take as long as, you know, Hellblade 2 did. But yeah, that, that's good news. That's actually good news. Uh, last news uh, IGN buys everybody. Eurogamer, game, what's GI? Game industry. Game industry dot biz. Dot biz. Uh, VG247, Rock, Paper, Shotgun, and more. And yeah. I think this means that they now have a stake in digital... Oh, here we go. Yeah, uh, uh, Eurogamer. They bought Eurogamer, which owns Digital Foundry. Gamer... Well, apparently they only own a portion of Digital Foundry. Uh -huh. Gamer Network's publications are GameIndustry.biz, Eurogamer, including six local language editions, Rock, Paper, Shotgun, VG247, and Dicebreaker, which I've never heard of before. The business also holds shares in outside Xbox, Digital Foundry, and Hookshot, which operates Nintendo Life, Push Square, Pure Xbox, and Time Extension. I forgot about Time Extension. Yeah. Um, IGN Entertainment is a division of Ziff Davis that includes IGN, Map, Genie, How Long to Beat, and yeah. Humble Bundle. Yeah. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. It has acquired the websites from PAX and New York Comic Con organizer Reed Pop which initially bought the gamer business uh, network business in 2018. I forgot about that. I, yeah. uh, Reed Pop owned Nintendo Life. I knew that. I thought for a second that IGN bought Reed Pop, but no, that would have been nuts. That would have been nuts. Uh, um, John Linneman, who runs Digital Foundry, uh, says it will not negatively impact Digital Foundry. So that in response to somebody on Twitter. Yeah, I'm interested in that because uh, how much of a stake do they own? Yeah, if they, own a, if they yeah. own a majority stake, then that's going to be a, a fucking issue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is just weird because right that means that we got IGN and Kot Kotaku, and that's it. Who else is there? Polygon, GameStop, um, Video Game Chronicles, Game Informer, Game Informer. which is GameStop. It's the same thing. Yeah, GameSpot. GameSpot. That's what I meant to say. Oh, GameSpot. Who owns GameSpot? I want to say CBS. <laughs> CNET. Okay. And it says Paramount Streaming. Yeah, that's CBS. Oh. So Viacom. Okay. Yeah. So that is a lot more than I than I thought there was. Yeah, but it's just it's just weird that IGN, ostensibly mm -hmm. the biggest video game news website on the planet, now owns all these other companies. Why? I didn't <laughs> There's even, no need for that. I didn't even know they were doing that well. That they can just buy all of these other companies. Yeah, I guess They're, Repop just wanted to offload them. Probably. I mean, it made no sense for Repop to own these things. Then again, it makes no sense for IGN to own them. 
Yeah, I don't know. Reed Pop seemed to have gotten them ads and stuff for some reason, yeah. somehow. I don't I don't know. I think Reed Pop like owned like a management thing. Yeah. They did it. I don't know. But um Yeah, it's weird it's weird that IGN uh, decides decided to. Uh, I mean, it's also weird that IGN owns How Long to Beat and Humble Bundle. Yeah. That's I thought Microsoft did something with How Long no i guess they just put it on yeah. their their stores like if you go to like a like a oh, game it says it yeah if you go to a game on uh on x the xbox storefront it'll show you how long to be oh nice yeah um so anyway i don't know that's weird i thought yeah. that i thought that was no weird. it's very weird it's also very scary because like you know they bought the, the this company and then like they already started laying people off because of redundancies so yes it's, just, that's it's the more thing. like corporate consolidation uh We've seen a lot of layoffs in game in 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 games period, but mm-hmm. uh, in games journalism, we've seen a lot. Of yeah. And, uh, right when this news got announced, a lot of people got fired. Yeah. And that's really strange. Because mm-hmm. why are you buying them then? Yeah. Anyway, here's tweet of the week. Tweet of the week. Tweet of the week. Tweet of the week. This is from uh, Pyro Panda. It's a reply to an old tweet that says. Hard to believe it's been three years, and it's a picture of me in a dress <laughs> from three years ago, and it's in his wallet. It's a Polaroid that's in his wallet that's clearly been there for yes. three years. I want to know what he says to people when he pulls out his wallet. Also, he tweeted this exact... Oh, it wasn't exactly three years. It was close, though. Close. May 17th to May 13th. Yeah. Uh... What the fuck, dude? <laughs> That's so weird. But I, I respect it. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, all right. Uh, now we'll talk to you people. Yes. Let's start with uh, answering some questions that people left on last week's Wolfden Podcast over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolfden Podcast, where you can now see these shows live when they happen. Uh, last week we saw Pete who said, I know Bob likes Mario games more than Zelda ones, but what about you? Uh, in agreement, hundred percent. I think, I think you thought he was going to be on your side. Nope. I, I think we don't like Zelda games for like the same reasons. Yeah. I don't honestly. like figuring out what to do and where to go. And I don't like going back to places I've been to already. See, all right. So it's similar. Like, I don't mind backtracking so much. My problem with Zelda is there's always comes a point where like the, uh, the obtuseness becomes too obtuse. You know, like, I get, like, trying to figure things out on your own, but, like, they're always, they're, especially with the 3D games, there always come a point where it's like, I'm giving you nothing. Yeah. You get no clues, nothing. Good luck. Fuck you. <laughs> so, replaying the beginning of Twilight Princess uh, made me hate it in all different ways. Yeah. Because the whole beginning is just, you gotta go talk to Sarah so that you can start your journey. Yeah. And then it's like, Sarah's out uh, get, baking bread. You got to talk yeah. to Richie, who's got the bread, so that you can go find her. And then you go to Richie. Sarah's not here, but you got to help me bake all this bread. Yeah. And then you got to, you know, there's, there's, all, there's all this weird misdirection. You got you to gotta remember what the main goal is to, and do all these other dumb bullshit things before you can even get right. there. Uh, and that's annoying. I just want right. to do the thing. Yeah, yeah, which is why, like, I think Breath of the Wild works so well because no, that gives you even less. But like, there's always something to do. Yeah, and it's it helps, always exciting. It helps the main do. goal. Yeah, and it's not, that doesn't mean I like I I'm fine with uh, RPGs or like games. I like Metroidvanias. Yeah, yeah, and that that's the thing. There's a lot of backtracking in yeah. Metroid games. In Animal Well, there's a lot of backtracking, yeah. but I like that because it's like, oh, I got this thing. I know that that thing opens yeah. this thing, and getting to that spot isn't a huge pain in the ass. But yeah. in like Ocarina of Time, going backwards, it, it sucked. Yeah. Um, but I don't mind games where uh, there's where it's set up like that. It's an open world. You have to talk to somebody, and then you got to go do a thing. Like mm-hmm. there's a, plenty of games that are like that that are just fine. But for whatever reason, Zelda puts all these roadblocks in the way that. Yeah. Uh, uh, the whole beginning of fucking Twilight Princess is just talking to people, mm-hmm. and that sucks. Anyway, uh, G one two one three four three says, "If these two don't stop shitting on Jar Jar Binks, I'm gonna leave." <laughs> Were we shitting on Jar Jar Binks last week? We compared him to something. I mean, 
look, I know uh, Ahmed Best is getting his flowers like these days, which he deserves, but like it doesn't change the fact that the character sucks. <laughs> yeah. There was something like, there was a character that was getting a movie or their own game or something. And I was like, that's like giving George R. Binks a, yeah. a, a movie. Anyway, uh, may the goo be with you says finding time to even play games anymore is hard, let alone finishing them. Last game I completed was RE2 remake back in January over the course of a couple nights after work it was fun to finally get that game out of the backlog since I bought it almost three years ago. Yeah. I haven't beaten the game in a dog's year. Yeah, I'm I'm at the point now where I'm literally just playing like, you know, I'm using the MSI Claw three out of ten according to The Verge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but like I'm, I mean, is what I was using the Steam Deck for too. Um, I was using it to play like games I'd played before, but like I like are relaxing to me and like are comfortable to me, like the Arkham games, like Resident Evil Two, or like you know things along like Tomb Raider. Yeah, uh, I'm playing games along those lines because I. Yes, I played them before, I've beaten them before, but like they're comforting to me. And I can play them for a little bit before bed and then go to sleep. Whereas like finding the time to like sit down and play a, like a newer game. Like I've had that Ghost of Tsushima in my PS5 for like months now. And like I really want to play it. I don't know when the hell I'm ever going to play it. Yeah, it's daunting to want to start a game that I know is going to take me 20 hours to beat. Yeah. That's why I like uh, uh, Hellblade. Yeah. Is that the name of the game? <laughs> <laughs> it's six hours i'm like all right dude yeah plowed through that As in, like i was telling my wife like she said like it was late at night she's like are you gonna go play video games and i said no because it's like 9 30 and by the time i start the game and actually get into it it's going to be 11 o'clock yeah. and like i'm gonna want to go to bed so. yeah and then i get a i get a message on discord hey it's time and then i gotta go play valorant for yeah. four hours uh invictus bloom says my hot take ps5 dual sense controllers have a worse ace of stick drift than Switch Joy-Cons do. Whoa. Years of heavy use on my OG Joy-Con set, nada, versus one year of light use with my dual sense. couldn't even use the thing my left stick drifted to the left so dang much. So I think that uh, there has always been drift on every single thumbstick that exists. Right. They are, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, they depreciate. Yeah. So they're they're meant to depreciate just the way that they function so it's just that on the joy cons it's pretty bad on the dual sense control it's pretty bad too i've never had a joy con that drifted um i think i just got lucky also i don't really use joy con that much right uh you just got unlucky that your he has that your dual sense control drifted i also think that um the Nintendo Switch was extremely popular, and people heard that stick drift was an issue, and everybody just got in their heads and was like, oh, I got stick drift. Yeah. Like, uh, well, I have a friend who, I have multiple friends who, who I was trying to find a Joy-Con that had drift, and I had multiple friends uh, give me their Joy-Cons, and I took them, and they wouldn't drift for me. So I had drift. No, you definitely did. I had drift. Because I, didn't I try it? And yeah. I was like, this is fucking definitely drift. A friend of mine had drift. Mm -hmm. And did you use his, though? I didn't use it. That's the thing, because yeah. like, <laughs> well, I, I feel like a lot of people are making it up. That's what I'm saying. There's varying levels of drift. Like yeah. mine, I don't think was that severe, but like, you know, who knows? My friends could have been like really bad. You know, I think I think the thing with the switch, the reason, because like I had never heard of Joy-Con drift until of a uh, stick drift until the switch. And I think it became a big issue with the Switch, A, because the Switch is, like, the most popular system, but B, because of the way the controller was designed. You know, everything was so truncated and short, and, like, the grinding of, like, the potentiometers, like, just became more and more prevalent. You know, because, like, we have PS2 controllers that, like, still work. We have, like, 360 controllers that still work, you know? Uh, yeah. Uh... I think it's just the design of the Joy-Con made it more susceptible to drifting, than other <laughs> other uh, joysticks, other analog sticks. So there, with old consoles, it used to be if you left the controller upside down when you turned the console on, it would drift. It would just immediately drift. Well, they that, used to unplug it and plug it back in. Well, that's cool. because like it didn't know where zero was. Yeah, and it would have yeah. to like reset it. A drift is something where like it does that permanently. Yeah, and that happened. They, they every controller has has can have drift right 
It's just that it was very prevalent on the Switch for whatever reason. Well, again, that's two different things. Like, we're talking, like, what's happening with the Switch is, like, you know, degrading over time as opposed to, like, having it set up incorrectly. No. You know? I understand. I'm saying that old consoles also do what the Switch currently does. Right. It's just more prevalent on the Switch. Right. Yeah. Um, Except the Dreamcast. Never drift. Yeah. Call effect. Dreamcast. Ahead of its time. No, in they, every they, aspect. Those could still drift. Yeah. Uh, the gully kick controllers that have all effect, uh, it says no drifting, and they fucking definitely drift. <laughs> have you seen them drift? Woods drifts. Really? I think that they're not calibrated good. Okay. I think that they have bad calibration. But I've heard people, even in this chat, mention that the gully kick... I think somebody in the chat right now... So, so I put gully kick on my Ein Odin, and that was the worst thing I could have done. <laughs> Went back to the originals, the gully kit interface with the trigger buttons. Yeah, so... It's another reason why I think Hall Effect is just a marketing tool. Well, I think that the problem with Hall Effect is that it's all, like, third-party companies. It's all smaller yes. companies. It's like, if Sony or Microsoft or Nintendo were to implement Hall Effects, or yeah. even if, like, fucking PDP... Or like the, like a third party or uh, isn't he do doing Hall Effect now? Yeah, Hall Effect does not equal good. Right. It's just a different technology. Right. It depends on the company yeah. that is putting it in. You know. Anyway, KS Porty says my all time favorite Eula clause was when iTunes had a section that you wouldn't use iTunes to create weapons of mass destruction against the U.S. They should put that back. They should. Yeah. All. All uh, programs should have at least that in there. I was going to put this uh, in as the tweet of the week or something, but I found uh, Dad's Father's Day gift. Oh. Rudy Giuliani has a oh, coffee Oh, I saw now. that too. <laughs> I he was says so it's tempted. the best decaf you will ever have. <laughs> so we got to put that to the test. I, I think, yeah, I think I might, I might go in on that. <laughs> now we're in the chat. Question for the Wolf Den community. If I have a little budget of $100, where would you put it for a good device? I'm assuming you mean uh, a retro handheld. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, what systems do you want to play up to? I say the best retro handhelds are still like the RG35XX original. Uh, and that's only like 50 bucks. So then you have $50 to spend, uh, I don't know, go get a couple burritos. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on games releasing unfinished and costing $70? I fucking hate it. Yeah, that, really don't that's like a it. practice that like needs to stop. Why would I want to play X Defiant? Somebody explain that to me because it just looks like we have Call of Duty at home. Yeah. Is it just free to play Call of Duty? Is that what it is? I think so. That Somebody tweeted at us saying that not only does it come with a season pass, but it comes with like a preseason pass. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, Fred Nard says Jar Jar was Gollum. The Gollum movie. That's, oh, that's that right. was that's like what saying it was. there yes. is a Jar Jar movie. I'll give Jar Jar this, okay? Because like he was like the first fully CGI character, like in a in a live action movie, and like interacted with like actual human actors. And like Gollum came out two years later, and everyone treated Gollum like the big revelation in like that technology. And I think I feel bad for Jar Jar because like Gollum was cool. Jar Jar sucks. And because <laughs> Jar Jar sucks, like people forget like all the advancements like in movie making technology that he pioneered. See, I would argue that Gollum also sucks. <laughs> uh, Fried Biscuit says, Drift is what inspired me to do a shell swap along with a Joy-Con replacement. And funny enough, how I found your channel. Oh my god. Oh wow. And it's been it's been just love ever since. Uh, we're on Jar Jar again? No, we're <laughs> off. We're off Jar Jar. We will always be on Jar Jar. Uh, let me look at YouTube. You gotta, you fucking you delinquents doing anything over there? All my Joy-Con are all still in their original state. Don't touch them. <laughs> I got I mean, eight pair, though? Yeah, you know what? I'm in the same boat. I got like a billion. Yeah. I never use them. Uh... Hey, Wolf, do you think the MIG Switch releasing has anything to do with the delay of the Switch? No. No. I don't think Nintendo gives a shit. No, I don't think that they give a shit either. Uh, I did. Tw a lot of people are getting their MIG Switch now, and uh, I I'm going to be waiting forever. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, it's going to be a while. Thalias with a thousand bits. That's a lot. Yeah. 
says, sorry, the answer went so quick. I heard burritos. I am thinking mostly to go back on playing the Pokemon games. Some good old Mario and maybe the Nintendo 64 bad fur day. Uh, what was the handheld you guys suggested? I said the RG35XX, but don't get that if, cause you, if, if you want to play N64 games. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to think. Because there's, there's a lot. There's just a lot of shit. There's so ones. many ones. Uh, that's a weird. A hundred dollars is is a is is a. That might be not enough. You're, to play. Well, you're in the middle of of a couple yeah. of things. Honestly, a f- get a fucking controller for your phone. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rock PR today, my RG three uh, five XX would not charge. I guess the SD card finally died. Uh, luckily, I had formatted another one with Garlic OS. It's charging, unfortunately. I haven't been able to get to the BIOS. So now I have a fully functional device with no games to run with. Yay. It won't charge because the SD card was fucked up? That's weird. He says, I guess the SD card finally died uh, as Bob said it would. So the SD cards that come with these things mm-hmm. are shitty Chinese SD cards. Okay. Um, like off-brand, no-name SD cards. So mm-hmm. eventually they get shitty. Um, but that shouldn't make it so you can't charge it. Uh, some t- s- these things are a little finicky with charges. You can't use a USB-C to C cable. You need to use a USB-C to A cable. Oh, yeah. Like all, all this that's, shit. That's like a sign of like a cheap device if it uses yeah. USB-C to A because like they don't want to pay like the two cents to add the transistor. Yeah, Sorry. so... Try different chargers, yeah. uh, but it shouldn't shouldn't be too difficult to get a new SD card set up. Yeah, um, I'm going. Th- I'm literally going through my videos to see what for around a hundred. Oh, uh, get a retro. Get a retro. Okay, there you go. Whichever one you feel like. Also, this one. What's this? One? PDP. No, I mean, not PDP. Pal Kitty X55. Look at the Pal Kitty X55 and look at a Retroid. There's some cheap Retroids. Uh, Rob Collin. Hey, Wolf Bros. Just wanted to point out I am enjoying your banter while also watching a very exciting NBA East Finals game. Uh, I know no one here watches sports, but here I am. I know the Knicks uh, got knocked out. And I only know that because my coworkers at my 9 to 5 like basketball. And then the Knicks are the New York team. And they, don't, and they got like kicked out. Basketball is like the one sport I don't even have a, a toe in, let alone like I any interest. Like care less about basketball. Yeah, I know the NHL finals are also going on right now, and I'm really upset because the Rangers are doing good. <laughs> and as an Islander fan, I can't have that happen. I can only assume that the Islanders are doing bad. Well, the Islanders aren't like got knocked out in the first round. They got knocked out. Okay. I'm not the, surprised. The hurricane knocked them out. The Carolina Hurricane knocked him out. So I'm like, all right, whoever the Hurricane fight next, like, I want them to beat the Hurricane. And it was the fucking Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> it was in a rock and a hard place. Unrelated to what the guy said, would Nintendo shut down the MIG Switch? Yeah, they have. They could, oh, yeah. They could do it. Uh, I mean, I think they're Russian, though. So I don't know. Good luck. Yeah. Um. I tried to emulate games on my phone. I feel like there's a lot of input lag. Am I crazy? Uh, No. I have an S22. No, there could be a lot of input lag. Try using a different controller. Uh, Touchscreen controls are usually pretty bad. Is probably going to be input lag. Uh, try different controllers. Try some of that plugs in directly. Uh, try different emulators. Uh, fuck around with settings. Otherwise, try a new phone. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, f- Straw man, my Retroid Flip battery died. No replacement batteries exist. They said send it back to them in China and they will replace it for $10. That's actually really cheap. Yeah, but like, are you on the hook for shipping? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. Also, that thing just came out. So that sucks. I I have had an Aya Neo battery die on me. My my Aya Neo, it's tiny, Air, the Air one. Uh, I went to set it up to put Call of Duty on it because mm-hmm. I thought it'd be cool for Hannah to play Call of Duty on it, yeah. and it will not charge. It, it, mm. you cannot take it off the charger. Uh, so, I that's what happens when you release a new console every fourteen seconds. Is, yeah, is you're gonna have bad uh, QA. Uh, it's a cheap SD card. 
hey, I just switched it back to the old one, and it works. I think Hooray. I did get it down to 3%, so I guess the charger issue could have affected it. Yeah. We'll do better next time, so I didn't don't disappoint Amber. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that'll do it. If if you get it down, if you kill the battery all the way, it'll take a while for it to charge back up. Right. All right. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolf Den podcast is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on Twitch.tv slash Wolf Den and YouTube.com slash Wolf Den podcast. If you can't make the show for any reason at all. We always put it up as an archive version over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolfden Podcast. So you can go and check us out over there on demand whenever you want. But if you prefer to listen to us rather than watch us, you can do that as well because we're also an audio podcast on any and every podcast service, be it Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube Podcasts, Audible.com. No matter when, where you get the show from, folks, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us because that helps us with placement on all of those respective platforms. Hey, Ego the Conqueror. Aegon the Conqueror. Thank you for gifting a sub. Thylis, thanks for subscribing. Aegon, thanks for gifting another sub. Uh, and that's it. I don't know when I'm going to stream next because I'm not streaming on Thursday because I got to go to a thing. Uh, and that's it. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Oh, also, I don't think I'm posting a video this week. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm working on a video, but I, I need to hold it because uh, I need a video for when I. I'm not going to be here. Right. Uh, I'm banking a video, basically. Uh, so you'll see something next week. Thanks for being here. Uh, go watch uh, Jackson. He's streaming. Uh, bye. Bye. At the button. <laughs>